Hey guys, we're live again, so it's up on YouTube now. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So um, first thing we're going to cover is just a quick overview of the parts on the column. Um, I'm going to show this using this webcam, and uh, fortunately I can't really zoom in too much here. But the, um, the Helios chamber, let's get a little closer here. All right, so this is the Helios. Um, it main components are, are real similar to any SEM you're going to find. Um, in the center here is the main vacuum chamber. This is what holds the stage. This is where your sample goes. Uh, the stage in this microscope can accommodate a six inch diameter silicon wafer. So it's a rather large uh, internal volume uh, in there in that chamber um, but certainly you can put in smaller samples but that is uh, it is a nice feature if you ever have to bring a whole wafer over especially if you're working on wafers from like the fab or something that uh, they have four inch wafers are very common uh, the entire four inch wafer will fit in there you don't have to necessarily break it um, so when we uh, go to load our sample we will vent this and this front door will open and roll forward and we'll put our samples in close it and pump it down uh, some of the accessories are visible uh, from the front side here. On the on the front top right of uh, the chamber, this is called the Omniprobe Manipulator. Uh, this is used for doing TEM liftouts uh, or atom probe liftouts primarily. Uh, it's a very sharp tungsten needle. We can position that near the sample and use it to either pick up objects or move objects around. You can also use this to do electrical probing. Um, we've done this in the past where if you have two of those uh, on a system, you can do two-point electrical measurements uh, across devices, which is um, kind of neat. Uh, the two uh, main columns that you can see here, the, the first is the SEM column, which is this vertical column here that has the orange straps around it. Uh, normally, when you use the Helios, there will be a decorative cover over this, but right now we have the cover off for some maintenance issues. Uh, so you can actually see this is the electron column. Uh, so the field emission gun is at the top. Uh, there's a series of lenses that the electron beam passes through, and then it goes down into the chamber and hits your sample. When you're using the focused ion beam part of this system, the uh, FIB is this column on the angle here. The offset angle between the SEM and FIB is 52 degrees, uh, which is going to be a number you're going to want to remember. So anytime you want to work with the FIB, uh, we would take our sample and we would tilt it 52 degrees using the stage. and that positions it in line with the FIB column. Uh, this accessory on the left here is called the EDSD camera. That stands for Electron Backscatter Diffraction. Uh, this is used to determine the grain orientations in a uh, polycrystalline sample. Uh, probably not very relevant to you guys, uh, just for your specific projects, but um, for a lot of users, uh, this is a nice accessory to try to find certain grain orientations or just map out the grain orientations in your sample. There are uh, three gas injectors on the Helios. Uh, one of them you can be seen here on the front, and there's two more on the back side of the ion column. The gas injectors are used to deposit material onto your sample. Uh, this is used for a variety of purposes. Uh, you can use it to make electrical contacts. You can use it to protect the surface. Um, we use it frequently as a hard milling mask when you're preparing either TEM or atom probe samples, you would deposit some material and then cut through it and you get a better cut profile. Uh, it also helps protect the surface from fib damage. The three deposition chemistries that the Helio 650 has are silicon oxide on the front and then platinum and carbon. So uh, three different materials can be deposited uh, using those gas injectors. Uh, the Gas injector for silicon oxide also has the added advantage that we can reconfigure it to deposit water vapor, uh, which is useful if you're doing cryogenic experiments, or um, the water vapor can be used as an etching assist, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. Let me see if I can get the camera around the back side so you can see. Um, maybe I can just hold it. Uh, so on the back side of the microscope, this is the EDS detector or EDAX detector, someone, some people call it, or EDX. 
Um, so this thing uh, collects the x-rays generated from the sample when the uh, electron beam hits the sample, and we can use it to measure composition. Um, so that's the EDS detector. And we're moving a little bit more here. And then on the other side of the microscope back here, um, there are two retractable detectors. Uh, this one right here um, is the concentric backscatter detector. So this is an insertable detector. When it's used, this, this rod slides into the chamber, and there's a solid state uh, detector on the end of that. Uh, so that's called the, the concentric backscatter detector, or CBS. And then there's another insertable detector around the, the back here uh, called the stem detector, which is used for doing stem imaging uh, just like in a, in a full-size TEM or full-size stem. So that's another retractable solid state detector that slides in and out. Um, I'm not going to show anything about the stem detector today, but I will demonstrate the backscatter detector. On this uh, top corner of the microscope, there are two additional accessories I wanted to make you aware of. Uh, the first one here, this is called the nav cam. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate this when we load a sample, but this is used to take pictures of the stage. So you can use it to navigate around if you have uh, multiple samples on the stage. You can use that optical image to go from one sample to another, which is very useful. Um, this accessory right here is a built-in plasma cleaner for the chamber. Uh, this can be used to either clean the chamber uh, or it can be used to clean your samples. So if your samples have some hydrocarbon residue on them, uh, you can use that plasma cleaner to kind of uh, polish or burn off some of that contamination so you get better, uh, better uh, imaging quality. Uh, the other accessory that's on the Helios is this uh, load lock. This is made by Quorum. Uh, this is actually combined with a cryo stage. So we can use this to transfer samples into the microscope and uh, cool those samples down to minus 190 degrees C. And you can do SEM imaging or FIB cutting at cold temperatures. And then you can warm, them, warm the samples back up and then take them out uh, through this uh, loading port. Um, Cryogenic milling is done a lot on biological samples or soft materials like some uh, polymer samples. You can uh, sometimes get better cut quality if you mill through them when they're cold compared to room temperature because the fib tends to cause some heat buildup and it can melt or damage structures. Uh, so the cryo stage helps with some of that. Um, so that's a, that's a neat accessory we have here. All right, so I'm going to put the webcam back on the tripod, and uh, we'll look at the software um, user interface for a second here. Let's turn off the webcam. Uh, so this, uh, what you can see here is the user interface for the Helios. Um, the user interface has three main uh, areas that I like to point out. Uh, the first big area is the, um, the center four quadrants. This is where you're going to see most of your imaging signals on this microscope. So we can use these quadrants to show images from the SEM or from the FIB. And it also shows images of the internal chamber camera and the nav cam, which can be used to, to move around on the stage. Uh, so this is where you're doing your main imaging. There is a bar of, of shortcut buttons across the top of the screen that uh, we usually refer to this as the toolbar. Um, these icons and shortcuts are used to change some of the conditions on the microscope um, as you're using it. And then the right hand side of the screen is uh, what we call the panel. And the panel has an additional set of features that you can uh, use to control the microscope or the electron beam or the FIB. 
the panel is subdivided into a series of tabs. So there's seven distinct tabs up here at the top. And as you click through the tabs, you'll see that there are different functions underneath each tab. Uh, the first tab is where we're going to spend a majority of our time when we're doing SEM imaging. It's called the beam control tab. And this is where we're going to, to go to change things like accelerating voltage, beam current. Uh, we can control the stigmators, the uh, beam shift. Um, if you're doing beam deceleration or stage bias imaging, that control is here as well. The beam control tab is also where you go to activate the vacuum pump or to vent the chamber, uh, which is what we're going to do to load samples. And also where we go to turn on the, the beam. The second tab is called the navigation tab. And this tab is primarily used to control the position of the stage and the position of the samples. So the stage can uh, move in five different axes, X, Y, Z, tilt, and rotation. And you have control over all five axes positions here in this tab. You can also save stage positions. If you have multiple samples, you can find each sample, save them in a, in a position list, and then quickly move around between those uh, various sites. The third tab is called the patterning tab. This tab is, is primarily used with the fib uh, to draw and create various types of shapes and cuts. So if we want to deposit material, we would use the gas injector system, which is down here. Uh, if we want to make cuts, we can use the various pattern types uh, that are in here. So we have rectangles, circles, lines, polygons, uh, things like that. Um, you can build arrays of shapes. You can build um, composite shapes, things like that, all in, in this uh, software, which is really nice. The fourth tab is called the image processing tab, and this is used mainly for performing measurements, or it has a crude uh, image processing and Photoshop kind of tool where you can do digital contrast, digital brightness enhancement, uh, gamma correction. You can do false colorizing of your images in here. Uh, normally, if I'm doing any of this type of, of thing, I would do it in another uh, application. I wouldn't waste my time trying to Photoshop my images on the microscope, but you can do some limited things here in the software. Uh, the main thing in the, that you're going to want to use in here is the measurement feature. So you can uh, draw measurements on the directly on the screen to measure dimensions. The fifth tab is called the detector tab. This allows us to select between the various detectors that are on the system. There are three detectors that will we can use with the uh, with the SEM for performing secondary electron imaging, and those are the Everhart Thornley detector or ETD, the through lens detector or TLD detector, and the ICE detector, which stands for ion conversion and electron detector. So all three of these detectors can uh, be configured to collect secondary electrons, or they can also be set up in modes that collect backscatter electrons. But normally we would use these in secondary electron mode. The concentric backscatter detector, or CBS, is the retractable backscatter detector that I mentioned on the outside of the chamber. Uh, we would use that uh, only for backscatter imaging. And then the STEM2 detector is the retractable STEM detector, uh, which, again, I'm not going to show that today. It requires a special sample holder uh, to use this. Otherwise, this detector will crash into the uh, sample stage. The sixth tab is called the uh, sample prep tab. And this tab combines some of the uh, features of previous tabs under it. So it has the, the pattern control uh, from the top of the pattern tab. And then it has the uh, scan rotation feature, which comes from the beam control tab. And it has the stage navigation controls, that's, which comes from the navigation tab. Uh, I personally never use this tab, but the idea is that it combines some common uh, functions into one tab so that it limits how much you're clicking around through these other tabs. But everything in here is duplicated in another area. So, I, I, I again, I never use it, but feel free if you want to. And then the last tab is called the alignments tab. Uh, there's only a certain level number of alignments that are available to the normal user login. But I would prefer that you stay out of any of these menus. Uh, it, it's more likely that if you don't know what you're doing, you can get the system into a weird condition. So if you think there's a problem on the system, uh, I would request that you come ask me for help. 
instead of trying to use alignment functions to fix it yourself. So just please avoid the alignments tab. When you come in to use the Helios, you should find that the chamber is under high vacuum. Uh, the previous user should have left the system uh, pumped down. And we can tell that by uh, looking at the vacuum pressure. So in the bottom right of the screen here shows the chamber pressure. It's currently 2 times 10 to the minus 6 torr. And there's this little colored icon right here where all three uh, aspects of this icon are bright green. That tells me that all three main areas of the microscope are under a uh, suitable vacuum to operate the system. If one of these three areas is orange or gray, it means that there's a vacuum issue in one of those spots. Since the microscope is under vacuum, the first thing we want to do to load our sample is to vent the chamber. To do that, we go to the beam control tab, and we're just simply going to select the vent button on the software. And the microscope is going to ask us to confirm a uh, chamber vent, and it says it takes about three minutes. Are you sure you want to continue? We say yes. Now, this system actually vents faster than three minutes. The three minutes is like a default that FEI programmed in, but it probably takes about a minute to vent. I think the time, the venting time can vary depending on the input uh, gas pressure that you use to vent the system. So ours is, is up a little bit higher, I think. So it vents pretty quick. I'm just going to hide this status window for now. Um, that pops up a lot. It tells you messages about things changing on the microscope. Um, as long as it's nothing bad, you can just sort of ignore it. And I'm actually just going to slide it over to um, the other screen and get it out of the way. So since the chamber is venting, uh, you can see here that the uh, little status icon has changed orange for the chamber. So that means that it's uh, not under uh, suitable vacuum anymore to operate, which makes sense. We're venting it. So while we're waiting for it to finish venting, I'm going to move the camera back around so that we can look at how to load uh, samples onto the stage. So let's turn the webcam back on, and I'm going to make this one full screen so you can hopefully see it better. All right, so uh, hopefully you, you can probably hear it on the microphone that the, uh, the chamber is vented. You can hear the gas um, still leaking out through the door. The venting cycle will stop after a couple minutes automatically. Um, it, it is a little annoying if you're trying to talk while this is venting, but it will, it will turn off soon. Uh, once you think the chamber is vented, just go ahead and grab onto the handle on the bottom of the door, and you can wheel the door open until it stops. Now, when you open the door, uh, the sample is going to mount onto the stage adapter, which is sitting on the, the rotation plate of the stage. It can be a little awkward to reach into this chamber because the stage is way back inside here. What we can do to help ourselves is to move the stage out to this front corner, which makes it much easier to reach. Uh, to do that, we're going to go to the navigation tab in the software 
that we're going to move the stage to the coordinates of plus 75 millimeters for X and plus 75 millimeters for Y. So I'm going to go do that uh, right now. Focus. Let me try to get this focus just a little bit better on this camera. Let's see. Video. I guess that's as good as it. Good as it gets. Okay. So the adapter that you're looking at right now is one of the basic adapters that we have for this microscope. Uh, the adapters all attach to the rotation plate of the stage. Uh, some of them screw into the center via a single bolt, and some of them attach using three bolts. Uh, this particular adapter holds a single SEM uh, type stub. Um, so the stub uh, goes in the top right here. And then there is a locking set screw on the side that you can access with a small wrench. It's a 1.5 millimeter wrench to uh, secure that. Now I'm going to remove this adapter. I'm going to show you some of the other adapters that we have for this system. Uh, the way this adapter is removed is first we have to loosen this locking cone nut. And this is done simply by turning it counterclockwise. And I'm just going to hold on to the rotation plate of the stage uh, to keep that from spinning. So once the cone nut is loose, I can then turn the center bolt uh, counterclockwise until it's removed. Um, this is also how we adjust the height of these adapters. So if I turn uh, this clockwise, it gets shorter. If I turn it counterclockwise, it gets taller. And then we would secure it with the cone nut once the height is adjusted. All right, so we remove that. So some of the other adapters that we have for this microscope are um, this adapter. This one is commonly uh, used by a lot of our, our users. This one uh, is also height adjustable using a single center bolt and is locked with a cone nut. But this one can hold five SEM samples at the same time. Uh, five small SEM samples, I should say. If they're larger, you might only be able to hold two or three at the same time. So the SEM stubs go into these holes on the top. And then they are secured with uh, set screws around the perimeter of these arms. Um, and then this is screwed into the center and is also height adjustable. Um, other adapters that we have, uh, this one 
is used for the stem detector. Uh, so this one uh, has a single bolt and it locks into place. It has some locator pins that you have to position in the correct spot uh, like that. And then that center bolt is uh, screwed into the stage. This holds your sample um, using a, another type of uh, adapter called a row bar, uh, which is this thing. And this would uh, slide into the side of this uh, adapter. Uh, so the stem holder allows a retractable stem detector to insert below the sample, and then you can image the sample in transmission mode. Um, so if you're not using this particular adapter, then you can't use the stem detector. Uh, the last uh, stage adapter I want to show you is called the um, Universal Mounting Base, or uh, UMB. And it's this uh, device here. This is a modular stage adapter, which, uh, to be honest, I don't really like it very much. But some, some users really like this. Some users really hate it. Um, but as part of this training, I want to at least make you aware of it how it works and how to put it in or take it out. Because if you come in to use this microscope and the last user has left the universal mounting base in, you need to know how to remove it. The universal mounting base has two uh, distinct sections. Um, each section has three uh, hex bolts that are used to attach it to the stage. So the first part that goes in is this little spacer ring. It has three, uh, the three bolts there. They're captured uh, screws, so they don't fall out if this flips upside down, which is nice. Those three screws go into three corresponding threaded holes on the rotation plate. So there's one right here, there's one right here, and there's one right here. And it uses a slightly bigger wrench. Um, it's a 2.5 millimeter wrench that we always keep in the lab. So if you want to put this in, um, you just set the ring on the stage and then use the bigger wrench to try to get the three screws started. You always want to get all three screws started first before you um, tighten any one down uh, specifically. All right, so once we have those three screws uh, attached, we then have to put the top part of the universal mounting base on. Um, this also has three screws on it that uh, will screw into the three holes on the spacer ring. What's a little bit frustrating with this is that to get to those screw heads, you have to take the wrench and go down through these holes on the top of the universal mounting base. And for some reason, when the FEI made this, they didn't put the screw heads directly beneath these holes. So you have to kind of um, tilt the wrench a little bit out to the sides to find those screw heads. Uh, this is probably not showing up great in this camera, but um, when you look at this in person, I, I hope it'll make sense. Now, the universal mounting base can go on in any of three different ways. So it can sit um, like this, or you can rotate it 120 degrees this way, or 120 degrees uh, this way. It really doesn't matter how you put it on there. Um, and we can always rotate the stage later. Um, the stage can rotate 360 degrees. So uh, try not to worry too much about the rotation of this. Just make sure the screw heads line up. So I'm going to put it on just this way because it's the way that I like it. And then I put the wrench down through the hole in the top, find that screw head, and then I will start tightening each one. Again, don't tighten all, all three screws until you get all of them started. Uh, it's a good way to uh, prevent cross-threading the screws. All right, so got them all tight. And when you're tightening any, any of these small screws on these microscopes, uh, you just have to turn them until they're snug. Uh, with a wrench this size, you can easily strip out any of these small screws. So. Um, just just turn it until it feels snug. Don't don't over torque any screw because we don't want to damage anything. Uh, unfortunately, all of these parts are very expensive to replace. So if you strip out the screw on one of these things, it's probably going to cost us several thousand dollars to replace it um, from FEI. So just try to be careful as you're working here. So once the universal mounting base is installed, uh, we then have to um, use 
additional adapters uh, which drop into this track, and that's what actually holds on to your sample. Um, so the adapters are, um, there's this adapter which holds SEM stubs that can hold three of them. And once you put your, you put your SEM samples into this, and then this drops into the track. And then a clamping device uh, has to go in next to uh, that insert, and then this is tightened with a set screw. Oop, looks like the screw is missing from that one. Um, we have more of these in the lab. So anyway, um, hopefully you get the idea. Uh, there's a lot of little parts that you have to assemble to use this. I think that's the main reason why I don't like it, uh, just because it's kind of tedious to insert and remove. Um, but again, if you like it, uh, by all means, go ahead and use it. If you don't like it, you, we have other adapters. Um, there is also a insert for the universal mounting base that can hold TEM grids. Um, so you put your TEM grids into one of these roll bars, which can hold up to six, and then this slides into uh, this adapter, just like that, and then this can drop into uh, one of these tracks as well. So the universal mounting base allows you to have TEM grids and SEM stubs in at the same time. Um, some of the big drawbacks to this is this system is not height adjustable, so it really works well for samples that are about the thickness of a silicon wafer mounted on a conventional stub. If you have a very tall sample, uh, this system doesn't work very well. Um, so again, it, it's not as useful as it could be. So that's, uh, that's all I want to show about that. If you have questions about the universal mounting base, uh, you can certainly either send me emails or we can talk about it um, in person or something if you, if you have a question. So now I'm going to demonstrate how to remove it uh, because this is probably going to be uh, the action that you'll have to do if you come in to use it and the last person left the universal mounting base in, it will be just like this. Uh, so the top piece is removed first by removing those three screws. Um, again, you just take the wrench, go down through the holes in the top, uh, loosen each screw a few turns. They are captured screws, so they shouldn't come out all the way. But just loosen them a couple of turns and then pick it up, take that out. And then we also have to remove the spacer ring. Uh, remember to take this part out. I've seen uh, users leave this in before, and it will cause you problems. Uh, so remember, this has to come out too. So again, three screws. Oop, didn't quite get it. And oh, still have that last screw attached. There we go. So we take that out. There is a uh, storage cabinet in the Helios room that we want to put all these stage parts when we're not using them. Uh, if I kind of move this webcam over this way a little bit, uh, you can see it over there in the corner. It looks like a desiccator cabinet, but it's not a desiccator. There's no desiccant in there. It's just simply to keep dust and grime off of the stage parts. So any of the components that are not being used should go into that cabinet. Um, so I'm going to put all of the uh, all of these parts back into there and close that door. Uh, I'm also going to put the wrench. Uh, I don't need this larger 2.5 millimeter wrench because I'm not going to use the universal mounting base. So all of this goes back into that cabinet. All right, so let's put on the, um, the cross holder that holds five samples. Uh, this is the one that uh, most of our users seem to like. So again, this thing uh, has a single threaded bolt on the bottom, which is gonna go into that big hole in the center of the rotation plate. So we just get it started by hand, uh, turn it a couple times. And don't worry too much about setting the height of this or locking the cone nut. We do that after we get the samples uh, on the adapter. So I'm going to go grab my samples. They're on the desk right next to us. Oh, 
Oh, I forgot. To, I I'm, I forgot to mention this. Um, if you notice, I have gloves on. Uh, anytime you're going to touch anything that is inside this microscope chamber, always put on a clean pair of gloves. The Helios especially is very sensitive to hydrocarbon contamination, and we want to try to keep the inside of this chamber as clean as possible. So don't touch any of the adapters without gloves on. Don't touch your samples without gloves. Uh, don't touch anything in the microscope without gloves. You can touch the outside of the chamber without gloves. That's fine. But um, don't touch anything that is actually under vacuum when the system is in operation because uh, we don't want to transfer those oils from your skin or oil from the gloves into the microscope chamber. So I'm just going to put some kind of generic uh, training samples on here. Uh, this first one is an alignment sample that uh, we get from FEI. It has just a variety of materials on it uh, that we can look at. Um, it also has a big silicon wafer on it that I can use to show you some of the uh, fib cuts later if we have time. And so once I have that sample on there, I'm just going to turn that set screw to lock that stub in position. And then let me get uh, some of my other samples here. Uh, this is a training sample I use for training a lot. Um, what it, it consists of is the uh, underside of a platinum spark plug tip from just a, a car engine. I wonder if I can get this to focus a little better. It doesn't seem like it's focused. Come on. Um, anyway, uh, we'll get that sample in there and lock this down. Now, one thing to be really careful of with the Helios is that, um, let me move this camera and hopefully I can show you what's going on here. If you have more than one sample, you want to have them all at the same height. Um, so if I kind of bring the webcam down here level to this uh, stage, you can see the sample on the left is about a millimeter and a half taller than the one on the right. Uh, about a millimeter height difference is okay on this microscope, but anything more than that is dangerous. So we always want to have every sample uh, about the same height. And if you can't achieve that, you want to load one sample at a time. So this, same, this chamber vents and pumps relatively fast. So it's not usually too much trouble to just do one sample at a time if they're all very different heights. But if you're in this kind of situation where there are only a, a little bit difference in height, what I can do is I can't make the sample on the left any shorter, but I can raise up the sample on the right um, because the, the pin that holds this is actually longer than it needs to be. So hopefully I can demonstrate this one-handed. But So if I loosen that set screw and I can kind of raise that um, stub up just a little bit before I tighten it and that will get the top of each sample in the same plane. So let me lock that. Oh, there we got a little bit of an under, under view here. All right, so if I just raise this up just a little bit and tighten it. So now... Um, if we kind of look from the side, you can see I've got them uh, much closer to the same height. Actually, I probably, from that view, it looks like it could have probably gone a little bit more. The real key here is less than one millimeter height difference. Um, so don't, don't worry about being, you know, microns off of the same height. Um, just get them close. The biggest problem that we're worried about here is that if we're doing very high resolution SEM imaging, you could have your sample very close to the lens. And then if you move the stage sideways, the taller sample can run into the SEM lens and that can cause some damage. And even if you're not doing just high resolution imaging, if you're working with the fib, the stage will be tilted. And when you tilt the stage, you quickly run out of uh, extra room above the samples. So it's actually much easier to bump into the side of the SEM lens when you're tilted than when the sample's flat. I found from my experience that as long as the samples are within about a millimeter of height with respect to each other, that you're usually okay. Um, but the closer you can get them, the safer it will be.
So now uh, that our two samples are on the stage adapter, the next thing we have to do is measure the height of the entire uh, adapter and sample system. And to do that, we're going to use a height gauge that should always be sitting next to the uh, microscope. Now this gauge ha is used by um, just setting it onto the stage and you kind of sweep it over top of the sample and you look at where is the tallest part of the sample in relationship to this, uh, this nose. Now there's two um, reference lines on this gauge. Let me see if I can get that to show up on the camera. Uh, the top line says max and that is equal to the um, bottom of this nose right here and then the lower line says uh, four and it's um, it's three millimeters below the max line what those two lines tell you is the shortest working distance that you can get to uh, if you raise the stage to its maximum height now let me uh, let me talk about this a little bit more because I think this gauge is really confusing the way it's designed uh, the microscope stage can travel 10 millimeters in the vertical direction. So right now this is at its lowest height and I can raise it up 10 millimeters. When we do that, um, we want to be able to get the sample at the correct height. And by height, we were referring to something called working distance, which is the distance between the sample and the bottom of the electron lens. Four millimeter working distance is the standard working distance on the Helios. It's also the working distance that is used for the fib. So what this gauge tells you is if your sample is shorter than the four, it means you can never get to four millimeter working distance, even if you raise the stage all the way up to its maximum height. So you always want to have your samples at least even with the four line or taller than it. Um, now, because the stage travels 10 millimeters, if you're exactly even with the four line, it means you're 14 millimeters away from the lens uh, when you close the door, right? So 14 minus 10 is four millimeters. The max line does not mean maximum height. It means maximum resolution. And in this case, it's referring to a one millimeter working distance. So if your sample is level with the max line on this gauge, it means you can get to a one millimeter working distance condition for high resolution SEM imaging. And so again, uh, if, you're, if you're starting out at this line, it means you're actually 11 millimeters away from the bottom of the lens. So 11 minus 10 is one, right? What I recommend you do is set up your samples so that this gauge just barely catches on the side of the stubs as you try to sweep it over your sample. That means that you will have access to all the working distance ranges that you would ever want to use. So you can go to one millimeter working distance if you want to, but you can also go to four millimeters for using the fib. You can go down to 10 or 11 millimeters if you want to do EBSD. Um, so in my opinion, that's the most flexible uh, working distance or most flexible height of the stage adapter to use is just, just slightly above the max line. The only reason I say slightly above the max line and not exactly at max is because it's rather tedious to try to get your samples to be exactly at the bottom of the gauge. It's easier just to be a little bit taller um, so the gauge just catches on the side of your stubs. Now unfortunately, uh, nothing on this gauge tells you if the samples are too tall. Um, this upper surface of the gauge is completely meaningless. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything if the samples are, are dangerously tall or not. Um, this gauge only tells you if your samples are too short. So with that being in mind, that being the case, um, try not to make your samples taller than they need to be so that they um, get above this max line. Because um, as I mentioned, that this is 11 millimeters away from the SEM lens when you close the door. Uh, so if you happen to be uh, 11 millimeters taller than this max line, you know, which isn't that far away, it's only about that high above this gauge, you will run into the SEM lens as you close the door. Um, also, if you happen to be uh, seven millimeters above, above the max line when you close the door, you'll be taller than the four millimeter condition, which means you won't be able to use the fib. So again, uh, try, to, try to avoid having your samples be excessively tall. Uh, just slightly above this point is, is good to go. So I know that's a long explanation. Uh, this is probably one of the more complicated things on the Helios, I think. Um, 
So again, I'm just going to take this gauge and I'm just going to kind of sweep it over the sample. And right now it definitely catches on the um, stage adapter. So my samples are really tall. So I'm going to turn this uh, clockwise a few times, make it shorter. And then I'll try again. So I take my gauge and okay, it's still catching on the uh, side of that sample. So I'm going to go a little bit shorter. And we'll try it again. And oh, so now I made it too short because I can move this gauge right over top of my sample and it doesn't doesn't catch. Um, so I want that means I can't go to one millimeter working distance if I want to do high resolution SEM. So I need to go a little bit taller. So let's turn it a couple turns back up. Try it again. And just right there, you see the gauge. It just kind of catches on the corner of the aluminum, uh, but it doesn't go over top. That's that's what I consider perfect. Um, when we close the door, we should be almost exactly 11 millimeters away from the lens and we'll have a full working distance range available to us. So now that we have our, our height set, now we want to secure the locking cone nut because uh, otherwise this will vibrate around and we won't be able to work with our um, samples. So I'm just going to hold on to the top piece with my left hand uh, or right hand. It doesn't really matter which hand you use for this. And then I'm just going to turn that cone nut clockwise and then turn it a little bit more with uh, two fingers just to kind of pin, uh, lock it all in place. Uh, this doesn't require a lot of torque to secure it. Uh, you should be able to just grasp it with uh, two fingers and get it to come loose. Um, same thing with tightening it. So if you ever feel like it's so tight you need a wrench or something, it means you're, you're massively over tightening it. Um, if that ever happens, if you can't get this to come loose for some reason, don't put pliers on this. Um, we actually had one of these adapters get mangled a couple years ago. Uh, I don't know who did it, but some student grabbed it with a pair of channel locks and put all kinds of score marks on the side of it and wrecked it. So just come ask for help. There's a staff around to help you with this kind of thing. So if you can't get this loose, you know, don't try to force it or use tools or anything. Um, it shouldn't be that tight. It's always a good idea once it's once you have the cone nut secure is just give a little wiggle to the top make sure everything feels secure um, i've seen quite a few times where users uh, only uh, gently turn this till it just barely stops and then what will happen is this will actually come loose over time and it'll start vibrating an hour or two into your microscope session and then you got to stop then to chamber and retighten it so uh, just make sure that everything is nice and secure um, all right, so uh, our samples are on the stage adapter. The height is determined. The stage adapter is locked down. The last thing we do before we close the door is we're going to use the nav cam to take a picture of the uh, stage. All right, so the nav cam is this uh, big silver accessory on the top of the door. Uh, the only uh, tricky thing about the nav cam is that you have to remember to take this picture before you close the door uh, because on this particular fib, this camera is outside the vacuum chamber. So if you forget and you close the door and you pump the chamber down, uh, this can't be used. So after you have all your samples set up on the stage just the way you want them, uh, you're going to swing this camera arm out all the way till it stops. And what will happen is the stage will move automatically below that camera. And you should see a live image in the lower left quadrant on the microscope UI. Once the image is live, the camera will automatically adjust its exposure and just wait a few seconds until the exposure looks okay. And then uh, we're going to acquire this image by pushing a button on the back of the camera housing. Um, so right, that image looks pretty good. Let me turn my webcam back on. 
Uh, so there's a button uh, right up here on the top of the housing. You just simply push it down and let go. And then uh, we want to wait for it to actually acquire the image. It takes a few seconds to get the image. You'll see the light turns off and then it turns back on. And there'll be a little progress bar that uh, shows up on the microscope UI as it records that image. Um, so it's done now and the light is off. So then we just simply uh, close the camera by swinging it back uh, to its side position. And you see that the stage moves automatically when the camera is open and shut. Uh, so just make sure you don't have your hand down here or anything, right? Because the stage is going to move. Uh, okay, so we should be all set. We have our nav cam, our samples are all ready to go. And what we're going to do now is we're going to carefully push the door closed. Um, as you push the door closed, you want to watch the CCD chamber camera, which let me bring that up. Um, so the chamber camera is the bottom right image there. Uh, it's a live image, right? You can see my hand right here. Uh, what we can do is, is watch that as we close the door, and we're watching for the samples to safely pass underneath the bottom of the SEM lens. Um, I can actually make this full screen. It'll be easier to see. So as we, uh, as we close the door, we just want to make sure that nothing is going to crash into the bottom of the lens. And I can tell that I have uh, probably about 10 millimeters, 11 millimeters of space between the sample and the lens. So I just keep going and the samples safely pass under the lens, they didn't hit anything, that's good. One of the easiest ways to break one of these microscopes is to crash a sample into the lens when you're closing the door. Um, it will instantly wreck that lens and it's about $35,000 to replace that lens. Uh, so just be really, really careful as you close the door that you're not gonna bump into it. Um, and this applies to any SEM in our facility, uh, not just the Helios, but um, you never, never, never want to crash a sample into the bottom of the lens. Uh, that's, that's really, really bad. Uh, okay, so now that the door's closed, we're going to uh, go into the user interface, hit the pump button, and that will pump the chamber down, and then we can start uh, imaging. So I go back to the beam control tab, and I just simply select the pump button. Now I mentioned earlier there is a plasma cleaner on this chamber. If you want to run the plasma cleaner, you can select this little down arrow and you can choose this option to pump with sample cleaning and that will cause the plasma cleaner to operate while the chamber is pumping, uh, which if you know your samples might be a little dirty, that's a good idea. It'll save you a, a couple minutes of time. Um, you can also run that plasma cleaner at any time during your session. So. If you're imaging your sample and you, you think it's contaminating really badly, um, you can just stop and plasma clean it for five minutes and then return to your imaging session. For now, I'm just going to hit pump. So I push the pump button. Uh, after you do this, you should hear the vacuum pump turn on. Uh, make sure that the chamber is actually pumped down. Uh, one of the good ways, uh, hopefully I can catch this here before it goes. This little mechanism on the Omniprobe moves when you have chamber vacuum. So when the chamber is vented, this will be out like this. And as it pumps down, it'll kind of slide down against this uh, screw. So if you see that thing moving on the Omniprobe, it means you have chamber vacuum. Uh, you can also, if you want, just uh, grab on to the bottom of the chamber and just pull on it. And if it's under vacuum, you won't be able to open the chamber. Um, all right, so we have probably about three or four minutes of just waiting time here while the chamber pumps down. Um, so I guess if you uh, need a second to do anything, uh, we'll, we'll reconvene here in a few minutes once this is pumped down. Or if you guys have any questions uh, you want to ask what, about what I've showed so far, um, this would be a good time.
Hey, Alan. Yeah. What was the purpose of taking the picture of the stage before um, closing the vent? So are we going to use that as a reference or something? Um, yeah. So if if you let me turn off uh, this webcam view. Um, so down here in the bottom left quadrant, of, this is the nav cam image. And this can be used to move around now on the stage. So on a conventionally with the SEM, you have a fairly small field of view, maybe a half a millimeter or so. So if you're trying to navigate around a, a six inch stage that maybe I've seen people put in 30 or 40 samples at once. So trying to figure out where you are and um, you know what samples you're looking at can be really tedious. So the nav cam image allows me to just simply double click on this optical picture and I can go to any of those spots that I want to. So for instance, if I want to go and image this uh, gold sample on this, the alignment stub, I just double click on this and it takes me right to that spot. That's pretty cool. Okay. Um, so, so again, if you only have a single sample in there and the sample's in the middle position, it's not very hard to find it. Um, because this, this central hole is is at basically zero x zero y coordinates. So if you have just one stub right there, you're going to start out right on top of it, and it's not that hard. But again, if you have a lot of samples in here, it, it can be really frustrating trying to figure out where you are. Or if you have a wafer that maybe a wafer that has like thirty or forty uh, dies on it the optical image is really nice to be able to move around and, and know that you're in the right spot. The more modern fibs um, pretty much made sense, at least the FEI tools made after about 2000 and I would say 14, um, have the nav cams mounted inside the vacuum chamber instead of externally. So on those tools, you can take the nav cam image after you close the door. Um, and if you guys get training on our, our Helios PFib, the plasma fib down the hall, uh, that one has an internal nav cam. So you, it's a little bit simpler process to uh, get that nav cam image. But on, on the Helios 650, you have to remember to get it manually before you close the door. Okay. Um, I've also seen uh, other brands of microscopes. I think Hitachi is one of them. They have a nav cam that like sits on the countertop. So you, you get your samples all set up and then you like put them underneath that camera and it takes a picture uh, in like a little jig and then, and then you put your samples in the microscope chamber and it transfers that image over somehow. Um, so like other, other vendors do a similar kind of thing, uh, but it, it is very useful when you have to move around a lot. Cool. Now, um, I should mention here, the system is almost pumped down. Uh, so after a couple minutes uh, down here in the bottom right, you'll see that we, we're actually getting a vacuum reading on the chamber. Um, and you can see the chamber is orange again. So orange means that it's either pumping or venting. Um, we're waiting for that icon to turn bright green. And that's going to tell us that our vacuum is good enough to uh, operate the SEM or operate the FIB. Um, the longer you have the chamber door open, the longer it's going to take the pump down. Uh, the main, the main thing we're worried about is is water vapor, and water likes to stick on all those surfaces that are inside the microscope. Um, so, like on this chamber camera, right? All this stuff. There's a lot of surface area in here. All that absorbs water, and that takes it just takes time for all that to pump out. So the longer you have the door open, uh, the longer you're going to be waiting to get the vacuum. Uh, when you, when I'm not doing training, uh, when you're using this in reality, it's probably going to take you about a minute to open the door, load your sample, set the height, and then close the door and pump it. So it takes a lot longer to show you during training than what it actually takes in real life. But I, I've seen cases where the, if the chamber has been open for several hours, uh, it could take 10, 10 minutes or more for the chamber to pump down. Whereas if the chamber is just open for like five seconds, it'll pump down in like two minutes. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, shorter times are better. Now there's no, there's no harm in, in letting the chamber pump longer. Um, 
it's actually beneficial, especially if you're doing the working with the fib and you want really, really precise small fib cuts, uh, better chamber vacuum is, is, is the way to go. Um, so this, this icon is going to turn green here in just a second. But if I was going to do any kind of very precise fib cuts, I might just walk away for 20 minutes and let it just keep pumping uh, before I even try to work with it. Because I know that um, those gas molecules that are still in the chamber, they scatter the fib beam and they degrade your fib resolution and your pattern uh, resolution. So if you're trying to make little small features like 20, 30 nanometer um, cuts, whether the lines, dots, whatever, that will be harder to do if your vacuum is bad. So, um, so now, is there like a is there like a ballpark pressure that we should be shooting for for that? Because I noticed it was like at two to the minus six before. Yeah. So the real, yeah, two to the minus six. That's about as good as this tool ever gets. Um, okay. Usually, it'll get in the kind of like the mid minus six tour range after about forty five minutes. The, the real critical thing when you're worried about pattern quality is um, I'm going to open up the vacuum test function here. Um, uh, of course, I can't see it. Sorry, my monitor displays are a little bit weird here for a second. Um, identify. There we go. Um, so this is a, this is like a test application that's used for um, checking the conditions of like the vacuum and things. Um, the electron column is on the right here, and it's got two different ion pumps on it, which are always on. Uh, here's the chamber, which has a there's a cold cathode vacuum gauge reading the chamber, and there's a turbo pump and a roughing pump pulling on the chamber. The ion column has an ion pump that's called IGP3 here in this diagram that always is pumping on the gun. But lower down, there's a there's a lower section of the ion column that is pumped by this uh, IGP-4 ion pump. And this valve is currently closed right now. And you see this area that's called the deep IDP is orange. After the chamber gets down to a suitable pressure, which on this tool is, is 1 to the, uh, minus 5 or lower in terms of tor, uh, once it gets there, this ion pump valve opens up. And this bypass valve right here closes and it causes the ion pump to evacuate the gas in this region of the ion column and what that does is it significantly improves your ion beam resolution so the less gas that's in the ion beam path the better but this function won't kick on until the chamber vacuum gets to um, less than i think it's one of the minus five tor now, when you're sitting in the room, you'll when that happens, you'll hear it because this thing makes a click, clicky sound when it opens, um, and it usually takes about 30 or 40 minutes to get to vacuum suitable for that to pop open. Um, but that's really what you want to have um, occur if you're going to do high resolution imaging. Okay, so if I was to go in there and try and do fib, I would kind of just. Uh, pump it down and then walk away for about 45 minutes and then come back. Yeah, uh, and, and it might not even take that long. Again, it really depends on how clean is your sample, how how short of a time did you have the chamber open, uh, things like that. Okay. Um, I can show you sometime like just how to open up this app to look at it. Actually, I can show you right now. On, on our tool, it's enabled. You just go up here to this server program. There's like this little bar that floats up at the top of the screen. You just right click on it. And the third option down that says TST MD vacuum, just click on that. And that brings up the vacuum uh, control panel. And you just want to look and see, is this valve going to IGP-4? Is it open or shut? So if it's shut, then you want to wait longer. And if it's, uh, if it's open, then you're, I would say you're good to go. And your resolution on your FIB is going to be better. So red means closed, green means open. And this little um, IDP section of the column, this should turn green um, when this valve opens as well. Unfortunately, you can't see any of this status on the regular little icon down here in the bottom right, which I think is really unfortunate. Um, FEI did modify their software on their newer tools where you can uh, see some of this as like a normal operator um, access level. Uh, but on other FIBs, 
this page is not available. You have to have like a service login to get to it. Um, we have ours unlocked um, for various reasons, but we, we have the ability to look at this um, whenever you want. Uh, do be careful if you're going here. There's actually all these buttons over here on the side uh, can do some pretty scary things to the vacuum system in the column. So uh, you don't want to accidentally vent the FEG or vent the ion column or something bad like that. Uh, that can be that could put our tool out of commission for a day or more. So uh, please don't click on anything if you open up this app. Just just open it up and look at it, uh, and then you know you can close it. All right, so our chamber is pumped down. So the little icon down here turned bright green. So we should be uh, good to go. Um, I'm going to move the webcam one more time so that you can see the control panel. Um, so on the desk is the keyboard mouse and the, uh, the hand panel. And hopefully you'll be able to see that in a second. to rotate that. All right, so this is this is the view of the hand panel. Um, we're going to use this to control a lot of the settings of the microscope. So the the big knob in the center is magnification. The knobs to the right here are X and Y image shift. Uh, this is coarse and fine focus, uh, X and Y stigmator, and then contrast and brightness. Um, so if you're if you're familiar with operating any other type of SEM, they almost always have this set of controls as some kind of hand panel or knobs or something like that. So um, I'm just going to have this image up in the corner of the screen so you can see when I'm turning turning the knobs and doing things. Um, so let me let me kind of shrink this down a little bit so it's not totally in the way. Uh, okay. So our vacuum is good, and the first thing we want to do is to turn on the electron beam. Uh, again, the focus of today's session is primarily working with the SEM. Uh, each of these quadrants has a different signal going to it, and if you click on a quadrant, it makes that the active quadrant. So you can see this uh, right now, quadrant two has a blue uh, color around it, and the other three are gray. So as you select different quadrants, it tells the microscope software uh, with what um, microscope you want to control. So if you notice over here on the panel on the right, all of these functions apply to quadrant two. And if I click on quadrant one, this display doesn't change much. However, this would all apply to the other microscope. So pay attention to the icon in the bottom left of each quadrant. It tells you what beam is, is being shown there. Uh, the electron column or SEM has this little electron cloud symbol. The ion beam has uh, this little ion nucleus that's like yellow and blue. The uh, nav cam is a little compass, and the chamber camera is a light bulb. And you'll see that as, as I select certain quadrants, some of these functions over here in the panel become disabled because they're not available for that particular image. Uh, but be, be really careful between the SEM and the FIB because uh, these controls look a lot uh, similar, and you don't want to accidentally be changing the uh, voltage or something on the uh, the wrong microscope because it gets really confusing. 
Uh, these, the controls also apply to the hand panel and to all these uh, buttons up here in the toolbar. So everything applies to the active quadrant. So if I have quadrant one selected and I turn the magnification knob, it's gonna change the SEM magnification. If I have quadrant two selected and I turn the magnification knob, it changes the FIB magnification. Uh, so just be aware of that. Um, it's something that I see a lot of uh, beginner users make that mistake. They'll have the wrong quad selected and then they don't know what's going on. So if we wanna turn on the SEM, we select quadrant one, and then we're gonna go over here and click beam on. And if we wanna turn on the fib, we'd click quad two and also click beam on. Uh, so two independent columns. I, I should take a moment here to mention, there's these two buttons in here called wake up and sleep. The wake up and sleep buttons apply to the fib column. Uh, the fib emitter has a certain lifetime to it. Uh, generally, they're around 2,000 hours of, of continuous time. And once that time runs out, that fib source would have to be re removed from the column and replaced. We can extend the lifetime of the fib source by turning off that emitter when the system's going to be idle for more than about a day. And that's what the sleep button uh, refers to and wake up. So if you push the sleep button, it's going to shut down the, the emitter for the fib. Uh, the SEM field emission gun never shuts off, no matter what you do. So sleep only applies to the FIB. Wake up will re-initialize uh, the emitter on the FIB column. Now, most of the time on this tool, we leave that emitter on all the, all, all the time. Um, if you're constantly turning it off and turning it back on, it lends or leads to some instabilities and shorter lifetime of the emitter. Uh, so really, we only want to put the system to sleep if it's going to be idle for about a day. Um, so if it's just going to be idle like overnight or for a few hours till the next user wants to use it, um, we just, just leave the FIB turned on. So the beam on button doesn't actually turn the emitter on and off. It just activates the, um, the high voltage and it active, opens the isolation valve that separates the column from the chamber. Uh, I hope that made sense. But basically, I... I would prefer that you don't put the column to sleep unless you know that no one's going to use it for like a day. Uh, so we click on the SEM and we're just going to click beam on and you will hear the column valve open up uh, if you're in the room. I don't know, maybe you heard that through the microphone. Um, the valve pops open. So now we have an electron beam and the high voltage is on. However, we don't have a live image because we're not scanning. You can see there's a little pause indicator in the quadrant that says that the scanning is stopped. So if I want to start and stop my scanning, I can go and click on this little pause button in the toolbar. So I click pause and then my scanning starts and I should have uh, some kind of image. Now you may find, depending on what the last user was doing, uh, you may find that you have like no image at all, even though it's scanning. Uh, if that's the case, what I would recommend you do is, is first thing is just lower the magnification all the way to the lowest value. So just take the magnification knob, spin it counterclockwise a whole bunch of times so that you get down to the lowest magnification of the SEM. Uh, the second thing is to look at the brightness and contrast. So you can either uh, manually do this with the brightness and contrast knobs over here on the left of the hand panel, uh, or up in the toolbar, this little half white, half black circle is auto contrast brightness and you can push that. And assuming there's nothing else wrong with the microscope, after you do those two operations, you should have some kind of image. Uh, if you still don't have an image, um, some of the common things I've seen is that maybe you forgot to turn the beam on. Um, it's real easy to double click this icon. Uh, so if you happen to do that, it'll still say beam on, but you notice that the button will be gray instead of yellow. So if there's no beam, the system will still let you scan, but you'll never see an image. So just make sure that the beam on button is yellow. Uh, that means that you actually have a, uh, a usable signal to work with. Um, other things to check would be the detector that you're using. Um, normally you're gonna wanna start off with the ETD detector but if someone leaves, leaves it in a weird condition, like maybe they leave the backscatter detector selected or something like this, 
then you're not going to get an image. Uh, now, the backscatter, it shows a message that says that the detectors are tracked, but um, for some of these other detectors, like maybe the TLD or something, you might not get a good signal just because of the nature of how that detector works. So I would uh, make sure that you're starting off with the Everhart Thornley detector. Make sure it's in uh, secondary electron mode and not backscatter mode. Um, in backscatter mode, you'll get an image, but it'll probably be pretty noisy and it might be kind of confusing. Uh, so just it's always good just to kind of know what the default should be as you start out. So Everhart Thornley detector, secondary electron mode, uh, lowest SEM magnification, run your auto brightness contrast. And if you still can't get an image, then maybe you start need to, need to look at um, aligning the electron column. On the Helios, that would be pretty unusual. Uh, almost always you, you should have a beam uh, no matter what you're doing. Uh, but on some of the other SEMs in the lab, that's not the case. You may find that you have to align the column just to get an image. Um, the test scan uh, Mira 3 is, is one like that, that if you pick a wrong voltage or, or beam current, you just like get no image until you do stuff. Um, okay, so we have an image and what we wanna do now is, is move around a little bit and locate the sample that we wanna start with. Uh, the easiest way to do that, I think, is the nav cam image. So again, you can just take the mouse and double click on, on a feature. So if I wanna go over here, look at this spark plug sample, I just double click on the nav cam and that takes me to that um, spot. Now, once you find uh, the area with your SEM, you want to move around using the SEM image. And the couple ways to move are to double click with the mouse. So if I double click on a feature, it moves that feature to the center of the screen. So I can just uh, work my way around the stage like this. Um, another way to move is I can draw, click and drag a, a box onto the uh, screen. And when I let go of that, the system will zoom into the center of that box. So this will move the stage and changes the magnification. So for example, if I wanna look at this little ball of platinum right here, I can draw a little box around it and that will zoom into that feature and also um, change, the mag or change the stage position. Now, if you click uh, bottom right and then drag up and left, it'll go to lower magnification um, and zoom out. And if you click top left and go down and right, it'll zoom in. Uh, now this function only works if the mouse is a mouse pointer. Um, as you get more into the software, you may find that you're doing like patterns and things like that. So like if I have the pattern tab selected and I try to click and drag, the software thinks I'm trying to draw a um, pattern shape on the screen so that that particular feature is disabled. But if I turn off my pattern function, I get my mouse pointer back, then that um, kind of drag and click and zoom feature works again. Uh, I don't use that one very often, but just be aware of it that um, you don't want to accidentally move the stage by clicking the mouse and letting go. Uh, now, if you do click and drag and you don't want the stage to move, just shrink the box down until it turns red and then let go and the stage won't move. And it kind of deletes that selection. Um, other ways to move are you can press down on the center wheel of the mouse and hold it down. And while you do that, so I click the wheel down and then the mouse acts like a joystick. So I can then start moving in, in, in some direction that I want. And I can change direction and I can go all up or down or left and right and things like that. This uh, speed will be proportional to how far away that yellow arrow is from the dot. Um, so if I want to move really fast, I can make the dot, uh, the arrow go a long way away from the dot. And if I want to move slow, I can keep the arrow very close to the dot. Uh, this also changes with magnification. So if you're at low, low magnification, the stage will move really fast. And if you go to high magnification, the stage will move much, much slower. Um, so if I zoom in here a little bit, I can move more controllably. Uh, other ways to move are you can use the arrow keys on the keyboard. Uh, so if I push, uh, for example, I'm going to push the right arrow key on the keyboard, and the stage will move to one field of view to the right. Or I can go up one field of view or left one field of view. And this will change with magnification. So if I'm at low magnification and I push the arrow key, I will still move by about one field of view at a time, um, or if I zoom in, that will change. Uh, be careful about the arrow keys on the keyboard. I've, I've run into this a couple times. If you like uh, rest your uh, lab notebook or something on the keyboard, you can accidentally push one of the arrow keys and cause the stage to start moving, and it's really uh, scary. Uh, so just 
be aware of that. That will move the stage. Um, other ways to move are you can use the navigation tab. Uh, so if I go to the navigation tab, I have direct uh, readouts of the five stage coordinates. So I can type in positions and go directly to those spots. You can also change this to a relative move and do relative uh, stage commands. So for instance, if I want to move uh, one millimeter uh, relative in X, I can just type in one and hit go to, and that causes the stage to shift to the right one millimeter. Um, I can do negative motions by putting in negative one, and then that will go to the left. Uh, this is really useful for rotations especially. So if you want to align a feature so that's horizontal or something, you can do a, a relative rotation right here. Um, we do have CompuCentric rotation. Uh, you can turn that on and off. And there's also a CompuCentric tilt feature, uh, which I don't think we're going to use that today. That's mainly used when you're tilting the stage for doing fib stuff. Um, but that is something that you can turn on as well. If you locate a spot on the stage and you want to return to it, you can click Add, and that saves this in a position list. Um, and you can have a whole bunch of positions saved here. You can also rename these uh, by clicking on this twice slowly. And I can change this to something like Spark Plug. And now I can come back to this exact spot later on. Uh, so if I were to move uh, somewhere else, I just click on Spark Plug and click Go To, or I can double click on it. And that'll take me right back to that spot. Um, OK, so that's kind of the basics of moving in the x and y direction. Uh, the next thing we want to look at is moving in the z direction. Now you'll notice that in the uh, stage navigation control, the z axis shows that we're currently at 0 millimeters, and the positive direction is up. So if I if I were to type in, say, two millimeters, that causes the stage to simply go up two millimeters. Now, that coordinate system is not very useful for us because I don't really care about the height of the stage. What I care about is the distance between the SEM lens and the top of the sample. And I want to I want to measure that and use that as my coordinate system, not the raw height of the stage. So let me go back down to zero. The way you determine this is by focusing the SEM image on the surface of the sample. So uh, let me make this full screen and let me scoot this out of the scoot that out of the way a little bit. Um, so down here in the data bar, uh, there is a parameter called working distance. This is changes as I change the focus on the microscope. So if I go and turn my coarser fine focus knob, that working distance number changes. And if I, the image on the screen appears to be sharp and in focus, then that is a good way to measure the gap between the sample and the lens. When you're doing this, make sure your magnification is, is on the order of about 2000 X or higher. Um, right now, my magnification is at 65x, which is uh, kind of on the low side. So uh, what I want to do is just turn up the magnification uh, so that I'm around a couple thousand x. It could be higher, uh, but just make sure you're minimum about 2,000x. And you see that I'm, I'm still out of focus on the sample. So I'm going to go and turn my uh, focus knob, either fine or coarse. It doesn't really matter. They both do the same thing. It's just one is faster than the other. So I want to get in focus on the sample surface. And now this uh, 9.5, this should be a good measurement of how far away this surface is from the lens. Now, once you're in focus, you need to go and push this button up here on the top of the toolbar. It has a little red uh, kind of question mark on it. It's, if you hover the mouse over it, the name of that icon is Link Sample Z to Working Distance. When I push this, it's going to couple that working distance value with the Z axis of the stage. So whatever number happens to be down here will then go over here to the Z coordinate. So let's do that. We'll push it. And this icon is no longer a red question mark. It's now a green up and down arrow, which tells me that we have a link established. And you see that the 9.5 millimeters from the working distance is now in the Z axis. The other thing that changed is the positive direction for the Z axis has now inverted. So now positive is down. So in the linked coordinate system, 
we are referring to the distance from the lens to the sample. In the unlinked coordinate system, you're just looking at the raw height of the stage. So now that I'm linked, I can type in whatever working distance I want to go to for my imaging condition. The default is going to be four millimeters. So if I type in four for Z and, and either hit enter on the keyboard or hit the go to button, that will cause the stage to reposition to four millimeters from the lens. Now, it's a good idea to do this process twice. Um, if I go back to my SEM image, you can see up here this little icon. Instead of being a green up and down arrow, it's now a red circle. What that means is that there is a link between the stage and the, and the working distance, but the software thinks you could probably improve the resolution of that. So what we want to do is once we've moved to four millimeters is just uh, zoom in a little bit more and double check your focus. And you see I'm still a little bit out of focus. So when I get back into focus a little bit better, my working distance is actually 4.2 millimeters. So I can just click the link button a second time and that uh, further improves the precision of this link. So if I wanna be exactly at four, I can then type in four a second time and reposition the stage. And now I, I should be really close to four millimeters. Usually that icon will change to the red circle as you go closer to the lens. Um, it usually doesn't change as you go further away. So if you see that icon switch, uh, just focus and relink a second time. Uh, that way you're just keeping the system uh, as safe as possible. So let me uh, update my stage position. So I'm going to click on the spark plug uh, over here in my save position list, and I'm going to click update and say yes. So now my save position is where I currently am sitting. Now let's say we want to go to our second sample. Uh, I'm going to use the nav cam image uh, and I'm just going to double click and let's go over and look at this, this piece of silicon over here. Um, and just double click on the silicon wafer and that's going to move us over sideways. When we get over to that sample, it's very likely it's not going to be in focus because that sample is a slightly different height compared to my the first one, the spark plug. So when you go to additional samples, the first thing you always want to do after you get up, get to that spot is update your focus and then update the link to the stage axis. So if I um, adjust my contrast here a little bit, adjust my focus, um, all right, so now I'm in focus and I should fix my astigmatism. This doesn't look so great. Right, so we're in focus, and this sample it says it's 4.8 millimeters away from the lens, 4.8 millimeter working distance. That doesn't match with my z-axis. My z-axis is still linked to the other sample, so the, there's a, a disconnect here. However, all I need to do is when I'm in focus is just push the link button again, and that'll transfer whatever my current focus value is to the z-axis, and now I can change this sample to be four millimeters if I want it to be right at four as well. And now I'm good uh, to work on this sample. So every time you go to a new sample, uh, focus, relink, and reposition the height to whatever you need it to be for that new sample. Now if I save this position, uh, let's just call this a silicon cross. I have my two positions saved in my list. If I go back to the spark plug sample, uh, one of the frustrating things about this software is it will not remember the link for that sample. So when I get back to the spark plug, I have to refocus and relink my working distance. However, the stage coordinates are remembered. So it, it will position the sample four millimeters away from the lens, just like it was when we saved it. But the SEM focus will be at a different value. So just to demonstrate that, let me double click on the spark plug. And you can see the stage dropped a little bit as it moves over. So this sample is exactly four millimeters away from the lens, but the lens working distance, the focus went to 4.8 millimeters because um, it's still linked to the other sample. So I just need to change my focus to get the surface back uh, in sharp focus. 
which uh, that looks pretty good. And then I just update my link and you can see that we are indeed still sitting right at four millimeters. Um, Cause again, the stage, the stage coordinates get preserved exactly, but that link is not preserved. So that it's, it's an annoyance. I, they could have wrote the software better, but uh, we're not going to get that changed anytime soon. So just uh, keep that in mind when you have multiple save positions, uh, it can be a little frustrating. All right. So once we find the area that we want to work on, we've repositioned it um, in X in Y and Z. You can also um, change the stage tilt if you want to. You can change the rotation if you want to. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that just, just yet. Um, the next thing to do would be to choose your imaging conditions. Our, our big choices for imaging conditions on the Helios are going to be acceleration voltage, uh, beam current, uh, lens, uh, lens type, and the detectors that you want to use. So four, four big ones there. Uh, let's just start for now. We're using the Everhart Thornley detector uh, and we're using the low resolution lens. Uh, so we're going to get into this in a second, but there's a, there's a low resolution and a high resolution lens. Uh, anytime you're working on imaging like small nano features, you're going to want to be using the high resolution lens. Um, that's really where this tool uh, shines and outperforms all the other SEMs in the lab is that high resolution lens mode. Uh, the low resolution lens mode is, is pretty similar to the other SEMs. So the Tescan Mira uh, is a big example. Um, image is about the same. To change voltage on the column, we have two, two spots we can go to. One is this drop-down menu up in the top left. So if we click on this menu, uh, you'll see uh, choices of preset values. Uh, you can choose one of these values and it will change the voltage uh, directly to that, that number. So we're currently at 2 kV. If we want to image at 5 kV, I can just click on 5 and that will change the accelerated vo acceleration voltage of the column to 5 kV. Um, it will go all the way up to 30 kV if you want. Um, as a practical suggestion, the Helios column is optimized to image at around uh, 1 to 3 kV, in my opinion, uh, maybe even like 500 volts to 3 kV. So if you're imaging higher than about, uh, I would say, 3 or 5 kV, you're kind of wasting your time on the Helios in terms of uh, SEM performance. Uh, you can get similar quality images on the Nova, on the Tescan Mira 3, if you're going to image at 10 or 20 kV, uh, I, again, I think you're just kind of wasting your time on this tool. Uh, so I really try to encourage all the Helios users to uh, image at lower voltages, image at 1 or 2 or 3 kV as much as possible because that's where this microscope really, really shines. That being said, if you're doing EDS analysis, you may need higher voltage to excite the x-rays. Uh, if you're doing stem imaging, you certainly need to go all the way up to like 20 or 30 kV so that you can get the beam to go through a thin sample. Uh, but for just run-of-the-mill stem imaging, I would recommend 2 kV as a as an all-around starting point. Um, this column should image very, very well at 2 kV. The minimum voltage you can go to is 350 volts. Uh, you will find as you drop below 1 kV that the resolution will start to degrade um, as you drop in voltage. So um, if you're looking at relatively large structures, you may find that lower voltage is still okay. Uh, it does prevent charge buildup. So if you're looking at like polymer structures or oxide structures that are fairly large, you might find that it works really well to image at like 3 or, three or 50, 4 or 500 volts. Um, and that way you don't have to coat the sample with anything and you can just image it directly. But you're not going to see probably 10 nanometer features imaging at 350 volts on this tool, uh, at least in the, the default uh, voltage mode. There are some other more advanced imaging modes that we can access if you want to image at low voltage. Uh, stage bias or beam deceleration mode would be the big one uh, that will let you get all the way down to 50 volts and still maintain uh, sub nanometer spatial resolution. Uh, but that's a little bit more of an advanced topic. So uh, that's one, one spot to change accelerating voltage is these drop-down menu with these presets. Uh, the other spot is you don't have to necessarily use those preset values. You can go to the beam control tab, and here where it says high voltage, you can type in any number that you want. 
so if I don't want to be at 2 kV, maybe I want to be at like 2200 volts, um, you can put in any value that you want there. Uh, very useful if you're really trying to uh, dial in your uh, imaging conditions real, real accurately for a certain sample. Um, you may find the presets aren't, aren't good for you. Uh, so let's just go back to 2 kV. So after you choose your accelerating voltage, you then choose your beam current, which is accessed in the drop-down menu next to the voltage. Uh, this can also be changed over here. There's another drop-down menu in the beam control tab for beam current. The beam currents are restricted to these specific 20 values. Um, each one of these is a different combination of a condenser lens setting and an aperture. Um, and they are, they're discrete. So we don't have infinite control over the beam current like you have on some microscopes. Um, but there is a pretty good useful range here. The small, the smallest beam currents uh, up to about 25 picoamps are going to be really good for high resolution imaging. So if you're looking at uh, 10, 20 nanometer nanoparticles, things like that, uh, you're going to want to be down in these small beam currents for sure. Uh, the spec resolution on a Helios is uh, a 0 0.6 nanometer edge resolution and we usually measure that at around 3.1 picoamps at 2 kV. So just get a, give you an idea of like where the best conditions are is kind of in this like 3 picoamp range for beam current and maybe one and a half to 2 kV on the voltage. The more routine imaging currents that I would recommend for just kind of routine samples would be 50 picoamps to around 0 0.4 nanoamps, so kind of in this middle range. These are all real good beam currents for looking at a uh, little bit larger structures, a couple hundred nanometers up to you know multiple microns or bigger. The large beam currents are really more suited for analytical imaging. Uh, you can certainly image a sample at, at one of these high beam currents, like 13 nanoamps, but you're just going to be throwing away a lot of resolution at the expense of a, a lot of signal. So I can get an image of my sample, but if I were to zoom in and try to focus and get a nice picture of something smaller than about a, a 100 nanometers, uh, it's just going to look really blurry. So I would preserve the big beam currents for doing EDS analysis, EBSD analysis, uh, depositions using the SEM, and uh, maybe maybe backscatter imaging. But even then, you really don't have to go up into these really high currents. It's just not necessary. Um, you should get all the signal you ever want, um, maybe at 0.8 nanoamps or 1.6 nanoamps at the most. Uh, you really don't need these big ones. So let's go back down to 100 picoamps. Uh, for me, this is this is like my favorite imaging condition. Uh, if I don't know anything about a sample, I would almost always start 2 kV, 100 picoamps, and it's not going to uh, it's not going to hurt you or hinder you at all. After we choose our image conditions, voltage and beam current, the next step of the process is to check the column alignment. Um, you may find after you get some experience on the Helios that you skip this step, uh, depending on what you're using the SEM for. Um, I'm going to show you how to dial in this tool for the best possible resolution for any given condition. But if you're just using the SEM as a quick check um, while you're doing like a fib cut, you may not care about resolution. You may just uh, get the focus and astigmatism fixed and it's good enough. So. Um, I'm going to leave that decision up to you, uh, but again, I'm going to show you how to really tune up the SEM for best quality if you need it. So there's a couple things we need to check. The first uh, parameter to check is called source tilt. And to check that, we go up here into the toolbar and we're going to click on this icon called direct adjustments. And when you click on that, it opens up this little floating window. You can drag this around and you can leave it. Uh, kind of wherever you want. Um, and there is an icon here for source tilt and a button called crossover mode. The crossover mode button lets us see directly where to position source tilt to get the best resolution. So I push crossover and when you do that you should see uh, the scanning change and you should see a bright spot somewhere on the uh, screen and we want that bright spot to be right in the center. 
Uh, currently, the center of the image is designated by a yellow crosshair. So I'm just going to click on the source tilt, and I'm going to drag this 2D adjuster around. And as I do that, you can see that that bright spot moves around. So right now, this, is, this alignment is really bad because the bright spot's way over up here, and the center of the image is down here and to the right. So I want to move the center of the bright circle to the yellow crosshair. So I just click source tilt, I drag it down, put it right on the center, and that's all I have to do for source tilt adjustment. It should be um, like 10 seconds. It's a pretty, pretty fast alignment. If you need to, there is a zoom slider here. You can change the zoom of the crossover. Uh, sometimes you may find that it's a little easier to see it if you, if you zoom in and out a little bit. Um, in certain image conditions, if your contrast is really high, you may see a little small satellite spot over here to the side. This spot applies to a different imaging mode called the, um, the monochromator or unicolor mode. Don't put the little spot in the center of the image. If you do, um, you'll get a picture. So like if I, if I drag this over and put that spot right in the center, if I go back to imaging mode, I'll have an image on the screen, but the column will behave really weird. You'll have weird lens alignment problems. You're not getting any, you're not getting all the signal that you should be getting. Um, so that particular spot is for a different purpose. So always go with the big spot. Um, ignore the little spot if you happen to see it. It's not always visible. It really depends on which particular voltage and beam current you're at. Um, but go with the big spot. So put that in the center, and, uh, and we're all set. In theory, uh, you can right-click on this adjuster, and there's an auto button right here. Uh, sometimes this works, and sometimes it doesn't. I think the software is kind of buggy. Um, you could try it if you want. I'm, I'm kind of nervous about trying it because sometimes it'll crash the software. But uh, in theory, there's auto functions for some of these. But I find source tilt is so easy to do manually, there's really no point. So we just turn off crossover, and we go back to our regular imaging mode. The second alignment that we need to pay attention to is called lens alignment. Lens alignment is going to cause the electron beam to shift in position as it goes down uh, through the column. So our, our, lens is or our beam is coming down through this lens, and we want it to go right down through the center of the lens field. If we're off center, we're going to get really bad resolution. The way you find the center of the lens is by activating, oh, I've covered up my adjuster. We click on this modulator button, and what that will do is cause the voltage of the column to, sh to shift slightly up and down. If the lens alignment is really bad, let me really mess this up, you'll see that the image appears to move um, in some direction as that voltage wobbles. In this case, uh, you can see the image is kind of shifting up and down in this kind of diagonal direction. We want to get rid of that image shifting by, by moving lens alignment around. If I drag the lens alignment adjuster up and down, it will remove the vertical component of the shifting. All right, so that looks pretty good to me. So now it's just moving left and right. And then I'm going to grab the lens alignment and move this to the left or to the right. And I'm going to try to get rid of the rest of that image wobble. And I say that looks pretty good to me. Check these alignments at a similar magnification to where you're going to image. So if you're going to image at 100,000x, at uh, do the alignments with the SEM at 100,000x. If you're only going to image at a couple thousand X, you, know, you can do these alignments at low mag. Um, but what you don't want to do is do the alignments at low magnification and then try to image at, a, at two or three hundred thousand X because the alignments aren't going to be very good. Uh, if you really are trying to push resolution on this column, you can also look at aligning the stigmator centers. So if I click on this tab here, there's another set of adjusters and modulators. Uh, these work the same way as lens alignment. You turn on the modulator, and you can adjust this amplitude a little bit if you need to. And what you're looking for is motion in the image. And if there is motion, you adjust the stigmator center to get rid of that wobble. And there's a, there's a stig center Y and a stig center X. And all these do is they cause the stigmator to um, wobble. So if I turn the amplitude way up, you can see over here that the stigmator in the Y direction is moving back and forth. 
and there's a little bit of image shake right now that we could try to get rid of if I if I wanted to. I usually don't bother with the stigmator centers unless I'm really uh, trying to push the resolution of this microscope. But keep that in mind that those are two more alignments that you should check uh, if you're trying to get the best uh, beam conditions. So I'm pretty happy with the alignment right now. So we did source tilt, we did lens alignment. Uh, last is we need to check our focus and astigmatism. It's useful to try to find some small, relatively round features. It makes it easier to see if you have astigmatism problems. Uh, I'm going to also make this go to full screen. It's easier for me to see it. Uh, there's a keyboard shortcut for this, which is F5. So if I push F5, it goes to full screen mode. Uh, you can also go to the window dropdown tab, and you can choose um, single versus quad image mode. And it conveniently tells you what the keyboard shortcut is for doing some of these things. So if you look up here, there's lots of drop downs, and some of them have a lot of keyboard shortcuts in there. Uh, so you can use the keyboards uh, shortcut if you want to, or you can just click on them in these drop down lists. Uh, I should also mention there is a help guide. If you go to help and you click on documentation, uh, this is the user manual for the Helios. Uh, we have copies of this on our server and also on the FOM documents uh, repository, but uh, might be a good idea to check out this user guide. Um, it's fairly well written. It doesn't really tell you how to use the microscope for any particular application, but it does tell you all the various functions that are available and what they do and, and how to control them, things like that. The other thing that's in the help dropdown is the keyboard shortcuts. This is a nice little PDF document. It's only two pages long, but it tells you all the keyboard and mouse shortcut commands that you can use on this system. So some people really like uh, keyboard shortcuts. So if you if you like if you like that and you like function keys, um, there's a whole bunch of them in here that you can look at. Uh, okay, so getting back to uh, we're trying to do focus and astigmatism. So I want to find just kind of an easy kind of round structure. I'm just going to use this thing right here. Let's zoom in on it a little bit, and I'm going to start by changing my focus. So I'm going to take my fine or coarse focus, and I'm just going to wobble back and forth. And I can tell right away that I have astigmatism. And the way you see astigmatism on an SEM is by wobbling focus and looking for features to distort along two different 90-degree directions. So in this case, um, you can see that on one side of focus, uh, so like right here, um, these features are elongating kind of in this direction. And if I go through focus, then they distort and they go this way. So that's the telltale sign that you have astigmatism. The focal point is the middle, middle position between those two distorting directions. So the easiest way I find to find focus is just wobble your focus knob back and forth a little bit. Get an idea of the midpoint where these features are not leaning either way. So I would say right about here. And that should be pretty close to focus. Now we want to remove the astigmatism. Uh, and we do that by changing the stigmator knob. So there's an X and a Y stigmator. It doesn't matter which one you start with. Just pick one knob and turn it one way and turn it the other way. And try to get the best possible image you can using only that stigmator knob. Once you think the image is as good as it's going to get, then do the same thing with the other stigmator knob. All right, and then if you're satisfied with your image, great, go ahead and take your pictures. If not, you want to repeat this whole process. So find a, uh, what I usually do is I go to higher and higher magnification as I get my image quality better. Um, I can also use a feature up here called the reduced area box. This is a nice little uh, small window that you can drag around and put it over a feature to kind of help focus your eye. But it also has the benefit that you can slow the scanning speed down and get better signal to noise in this small area. So I'm going to check focus again. So let's do focus. Uh, and I still have a little bit of astigmatism. Hopefully you can see that as I go through focus that those particles kind of lean one way and then lean the other or distort uh, in two different directions. So I say focus is about right here. That's the midpoint. And then I do one stigmator. And then I do the other stigmator. And just keep repeating that process until you're happy with your image. So focus, 
stigmator, stigmator. And I think that's about as good as this is going to get. Now, these little particles still look a little fuzzy to me, but that's because we're at 100,000x magnification and we're using a low resolution lens. Uh, if I want these to look really nice, I'm going to use the high resolution lens mode and those should look really spectacular. But this is as good as this is going to get with these particular imaging conditions. Um, so if I lower my magnification back out to a more reasonable uh, field of view for these conditions, something like this, um, or maybe a little bit higher or something like that, this should look really nice. So now what we want to do is to actually acquire a picture. Um, obviously, we're on the microscope to take pictures. Uh, there's a couple ways to get images off of this system. The first way is just change your scan speed. Uh, this scan speed adjuster up here in the toolbar, I can push the left arrow and it will cause it to scan one speed slower. And if I just slow my scan speeds down until the image starts to look nice and then hit the pause button, it will record uh, whatever's on the screen and then pause. All right, so it completes its scan. It's a frozen image, and I can now uh, save this as a file. So I can go to File. I can click Save or Save As, and I can save this image uh, to a, a folder. Um, let's just make a uh, train training folder, and I can just say uh, give it a sample name, spark plug, and I can choose uh, the type of image I want to save. You have 8-bit grayscale, 16-bit grayscale, 24-bit, uh, TIFF, bitmap, or JPEG. Uh, the best quality images to record off the of Helios are the TIFF 16-bit grayscale. I strongly recommend you use that format unless you need to uh, perform uh, color imaging or you need the color to show up. So I'm going to use 16-bit grayscale, and I'll click Save. So that's the first way to get an image. So just pause your scanning and hit save. And you actually don't even need to pause your scanning. I can save a live image. So if this is live, and I just go up here and click File, Save, it, whatever happened to be on the screen the second I hit save gets recorded. Um, a more convenient way to get an image is to use one of two preset conditions. These are called either Snapshot or Photo. And these are activated by this little button here next to the, uh, the beam blank and the pause indicators. The snapshot is your quick scan or quick uh, like acquisition setting, and the photo is the slow scan acquisition setting. You can also activate these by keyboard shortcuts. It doesn't show here, but the snapshot can be activated as F4 on the keyboard, and the photo is F2 on the keyboard. The settings that are used for both of those conditions can be changed by going to the scan menu and going to Preferences. In the Scan uh, Preferences menu, you get a, the ability to change any of the scan speeds for your live imaging. So this, uh, this list up here, these are my live scan speeds. I can change all of those here by um, clicking on one of these and changing the, the time, the dwell time. The two icons down here on the bottom of those, this list with the cameras next to them are the Snapshot and Photo Preset. So if I click on the top one, this is Snapshot. These are the conditions that are currently being used to record that image. So it's currently doing a one microsecond dwell. It's not doing line integration. This is off uh, 1536 by 1024 pixels. It's doing one frame, so no integration, acquiring in 16-bit mode, and so on. Drift correction's on. And um, the action is what happens when it's all done. So the action is currently set to none. I can change any of these as I see fit. So let's say I want to do a three microsecond dwell and I hit apply. So now if I click snapshot, you see here my dwell time goes to three microseconds automatically. It records the image and we're good. I can do the same thing for my photo preset. Uh, so if I click on the photo preset, I like something like 20 microsecond dwell time and the action, I'm going to leave this one as save as, hit apply. So now if I hit either F2 or I go up to the toolbar and select the photo in the dropdown, um, this gives me my slower scan condition with that photo setting. So 20 microsecond dwell time, which is a, a much slower scan, but it produces a real nice image. Now while it's scanning, if I hit the pause button once, it'll still finish its current scan and then stop. 
If I hit pause a second time, it'll stop immediately. That's real useful if you accidentally set up like a photo acquisition that's going to take a, a long time. You don't want to wait it, wait for it to finish. Just hit pause twice, and then you can go and change those settings. And because the save as function was turned on, uh, it automatically opens up the file save window for me uh, to save the image after it's acquired. The FEI software won't overwrite the previous images. You see that it used the, the last uh, file name I put in, and it has appended a unique number to the end of it uh, so that each one has a, has a new uh, file name. That, I think, is really nice. Uh, there are two options down here in the corner. You can turn uh, on and off. One is the option to save the data bar. So if you want this, uh, this data bar as part of the saved image, you can leave this checked or you can turn it off and it just saves the uh, image part. And then overlay graphics refers to any measurement or pattern. So let's say I want to measure a dimension on here. I can go to my image processing tab and I can choose a, uh, let's just do a line measurement. And then I can click and draw a line on the screen. And it says error because it's in cross section mode. So let's change it to uh, just regular dimension mode. So I have this measurement on the screen. If I want to record this image and keep that as part of the image, I want to make sure that the save overlay graphics is selected. And then it records that. Now that measurement is in kind of a bright green color. If I save this image as a 16-bit TIFF file, it will turn this into gray. And sometimes you can see it and sometimes you can't. So let's, let's try. Let's just say save it. And then uh, if I go and look at that image, uh, let's see here, training, right. So you can see that saved image. Uh, it's pretty hard to see that that distance is, is on there because it turned into gray. This is where the 24-bit format is really helpful. So if I save as 24-bit with the overlay graphics, that will keep this as this bright green color, and it's much easier to see on the saved image. Uh, you can change the colors over here, so if you, you, you want to play around with this, you can select like different colors and things like that. Um, and there's some other features that can be modified depending on what you want to do. Uh, it's all over here in these kind of setting windows on the side panel. Uh, okay, so that's just basic basic imaging. Uh, let's look at uh, the high resolution lens. Uh, so as I mentioned here, uh, the ability to see these really small uh, features is not great with using the low resolution lens mode. Uh, so what we want to do is switch to the high resolution lens. And the way we do that is this icon up here in the toolbar. Um, there are three lens modes available to you. The first one is mode one, field free. Second is mode two, immersion mode. And then there's mode three, EDX mode. However, there's only two objective lenses on the column. Uh, mode one, field free is your low resolution objective lens. Mode two, immersion mode is the high resolution objective lens. And mode three, EDX mode uses both lenses at the same time. Uh, the EDX mode is used as a kind of a special case for doing x-ray analysis on some types of samples. And just as a side, because you asked, you guys asked about this earlier, um, that valve just popped open that I mentioned, the, um, the IGP-4 valve, I just heard it go. So if I go look at my vacuum page, uh, you see here that that valve is now open, the bypass is closed, and the, uh, the differential pumped region on the ion column is now green. Uh, so I don't know how long that took since we pumped the chamber down, but maybe about 45 minutes, I would guess. Uh, so uh, anyway, we want to switch to the high resolution SEM mode. So we're going to go up here and just click to mode two immersion mode, and that will cause the microscope to switch to the high resolution condition. Now, in addition to changing objective lenses, the software will automatically switch the detector to the through lens detector. The through lens detector is the only secondary electron detector you can use in the high resolution lens mode. Um, in the low resolution lens, you can use the Everhart Thornley detector, the through lens detector, or the ice detector. But in high resolution, you're forced to use TLD. Because you have a different detector and you have a different lens, um, you're probably going to find that your image is really messed up. So you're going to have to kind of start from the beginning, uh, do focus, 
do uh, source tilt, do lens alignment, do astigmatism, brightness contrast, and get your image quality back. Uh, just to kind of demonstrate how, what that looks like in real time, um, it shouldn't take you more than about a minute to do this. So let's start with focus. Um, we'll get our focus back. I'm going to adjust my contrast and brightness a little bit. And then I'm going to just zoom in on some of these small little features here. And let's check our uh, column alignment. So I open up direct adjustments. I'm going to start with source tilt. So I turn on the crossover mode. Um, I can adjust my contrast a little bit to see the spot. It's a little bit off center to the left. So I just slide it over right, turn off crossover. And now uh, let's make sure my image is back in focus. Pretty good. Let me check my stigmators uh, just because it's pretty far off on the astigmatism. All right, now I'm going to check my uh, lens alignment. So I turn on my modulator and we can see the image is moving. Uh, so I'm going to move my lens alignment to get rid of that motion. Do one direction and then the other. All right, that's pretty good. Uh, I'm going to check my stigmator centers. Let's just see how they are. A little bit of motion here with the stigmator center. So let's, uh, let's try to fix that. That looks good enough to me. Try the other one. Uh... All right, good enough. So now the column's aligned. And last, I just need to check my focus and astigmatism one more time. I'm going to use my reduced area window. Check my focus, check my astigmatism. And now we should be uh, all set to image these really small particles. So now if I zoom in a little bit here um, and slow my scan speed down, let's just use the snapshot. So right now, I'm, my mag, if you can see that, I'm at 650,000 X, um, which is you know, pretty zoomed in for this microscope. My field of view is only 320 nanometers. And I can see you know, all these little small nanoparticles. If I try to measure one of these, let's, uh, let me just find maybe the smallest one I can see, maybe this guy right here. Um, you know, it's about six or seven nanometers in diameter. Uh, you know. So, the point of this demonstration is that uh, I'm not using the smallest beam current. I'm at four millimeter working distance. I didn't, I don't think I tried very hard to get the column aligned and I can image sub 10, sub 10 nanometer features um, in about a minute of adjusting the column. So when you're using this, if you're having a lot of trouble, if it's taking you 10 minutes or more, to get the image conditions dialed in, um, come ask for help because maybe there's something wrong with the microscope or maybe there's just a step you're forgetting. But this tool should image really high resolution and it should be pretty easy to use, uh, which again is why everyone likes this tool, but um, it shouldn't be too hard to image small, small features. Now we do have a little bit of a maintenance problem on this tool. As you can see here, the image is drifting to the left. Um, we're working with FEI to get this fixed. Uh, this is not normal. The image should be uh, fairly stationary. Uh, this will cause you trouble for really high resolution images, but if you're imaging at lower lower resolution, lower field of view, it's not going to be uh, too too burdensome on you. Hey, Alan, what's the smallest um, size nanoparticles that people have imaged on this? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I just showed you like a five or six nanometer feature. Um, okay. The resolution spec is 0 0.6 nanometers, which would be the, um, that's the width of an edge. And generally, you, most people would say you need at least three pixels uh, in a feature to actually see it on an image. So 
by that definition, about the smallest thing we could image would be about 1.8 nanometers in diameter. Um, yeah, I have a, another project I was thinking of that's probably would have nanoparticles around five nanometers. So I guess this is fine. To, to be honest, I mean, this is right. You can see these little features. Um, yeah. What you, the difference between seeing a feature and being, uh, you know, happy with the way the image looks is, is two different things. So right. I can see on here that, okay, I, I can say, okay, I got a seven nanometer feature right there, but you can see the edges of that are kind of fuzzy. Mm -hmm. So if I was trying to measure, say I had a whole bunch of these features that are all like seven nanometers on my field of view and I want to measure all their sizes, I don't think I would trust the Helios to do that just because it's going to be really okay. hard to put a measurement on this because the edges aren't defined very well. Right. So I can see it. I would probably go with TEM. If, if I had to measure a whole bunch of 10 nanometer features, I'd use TEM for sure. Um, just because I don't think you're going to be very happy with the precision of measurements from this type of image. Now, if I'm just trying to show someone that a feature sits there, it's, it's on that surface, I would, I would think this would be fine. Um, but just kind of keep that in mind. You, you want a lot more resolution uh, to get measurements than just observing something. Now I can try, let's see what happens here. So uh, again, I'm using 100 picoamps for my beam current and I'm at four millimeters. If I want to increase my resolution, uh, what I would do is I would go closer to the lens. So let's do that. Let's, let's instead of being at four millimeters, let's go up to like two. So we'll get a little bit closer to the lens and let's drop our beam current down uh, maybe to like, I don't know, let's try like six picoamps. Now, smaller beam current means more noise in my image. So, um, also I'm way out of focus here. Whenever you change the voltage or the beam current on the microscope, you have to redo the alignment. So we go back, we'll check our uh, source tilt. And that's a little bit off. Uh, we'll check our modulator. That's a little bit off. Check our stig centers. Yeah, these look. That one looks okay. I'd say that looks okay. If I'm doing a lot of high resolution imaging, I usually leave this direct adjustments panel up because you end up uh, checking it a lot, and it can just kind of float there out of the way. All right. So um, getting in focus with these low beam currents can be stressful to some people. You have to kind of train your eye to look through the noise. Uh, which, I don't know, some people aren't really happy about doing this kind of thing. Uh, okay, so let's see. Um, let me double check my alignments one more time here. Uh, as I mentioned before, you always want to do your alignments at a similar mag to where you're imaging because um, you'll find that the alignments change a little bit. All right, and I'm actually getting a little bit of contamination now. Now, one thing that's a little tricky is that I don't know if this sample has features that that are like a couple nanometers, uh, so I'm not really sure if we're actually going to see anything smaller than that, like seven nanometer particle. All right, so um, let me get to a cleaner spot here. All right, so we were at, I think, 650,000x. And apart from that being really noisy, um, I hope you can see, like, the edge, the edge widths of these particles is sharper than it was at 100 picoamps. I think I'm in a different spot because these look a little bit blobbier than where I was before. Um, okay, 
Yeah, these ones look a little bit cleaner. So actually now um, you can kind of make out there's some like, smaller little nanoparticles down in here that weren't visible before. So like mm -hmm. that guy is like four, four nanometers. Um, I mean, this kind of imaging is tricky because you don't really know how sharp those those edges are on those particles to begin with because right. ideally when you're trying to measure resolution you use a sample that you know has like a delta function type edge profile mm -hmm. or you know like a really vertical edge and if those edges are kind of uh, sloped then no matter what your sem resolution actually is you're it's always going to look fuzzy and right. i think that's what's happening here is these particles aren't um really well defined so they, they kind of look similar no matter what beam condition I'm using. Uh, you can buy samples that are made for measuring resolution at this kind of level, but they're a couple, several hundred dollars usually. Um, but again, if, if someone gave me a project to measure the diameters of a bunch of particles like this, I would do it by TEM. Uh, it's just way simpler and you're going to have way less uncertainty. But if I had to do it on the Helios, I would, um, but I would prefer a, a more resolution on the TEM for this kind of thing. Okay, and you can, like, I've done a lot of TEM before, but I've, like, let's say I had, like, a silicon wafer or a silicon chip, like yeah. a small piece, yeah. and I grew, and I grew a bunch of these, like, nanoparticles on there. I could do that in TEM too, right? Uh, I'm really just that would be a little trickier to set up, because if the particles okay. were on a solid surface, um, you have to get them onto some kind of a transparent film. Right. So that's, it, I think that's why I was asking about if I could do it on this. But. Yeah. The, the okay. real advantage with SEM is that if you're, if you're trying to look at like the outside morphology of the sample, you have to do it by SEM. Because mm -hmm. in TEM, you're looking at a transmission image. Right. So you always lose that, that kind of structural information. Uh, but for just measuring like a diameter of a particle, a TEM is going to be easier I think but that's assuming you can get the particle onto like a, a carbon grid or something like that okay. um, now we can do fib lift outs we can we can make uh, there's various ways to prepare samples like that to image uh, nanoparticles deposited on the top of a surface it's just it's it's just different sample preparation strategies to do that um, try I would say try it with the helios or or another SEM and if you're happy with the resolution um, great. If the nanoparticles are like 50 nanometers in diameter, uh, the Helios will do fine. You'll you'll be able to see them, you'll measure them. They'll be it'll be very precise. You'll be very happy with it. But if you've got two or three nanometer particles in your size distribution, I think even the Helios is probably going to let you down. Okay. But that that's a you know a very specific application. Um, you're just gonna have to try it and see. I, I do. I, I guarantee you, though, the Helios is the best SEM that you're gonna find. Um, even amongst the other vendors, uh, Zeiss, Hitachi, and so on, um, no one really makes an SEM that has better resolution than the Helios. They certainly have ones that are similar. And, and you know, if you ask Zeiss or Hitachi, I'm sure they'll say different. But in my opinion, they're all they're all real similar when you get up to this quality tool so if you really can't see it with the helios you're probably also not going to see it with a different sem and that's where you have to make the choice do you go to something else like go to tem you could also try afm uh yeah. to measure particles things like that okay cool um all right so i want to show just a couple of the accessory detectors and show you kind of how they work um the first one we're going to look at is the backscatter detector. And this detector is retractable and, and insertable, and you have to have the sample at a four millimeter working distance to use this detector. So 
uh, I'm going to move my sample back down to four millimeters. And double check before you try to use this, make sure there's nothing else in the chamber that's taller than the four millimeter reference line on the camera. Because this, this detector, you're going to see it comes in from the side. And if you have a tall sample like over here on the left hand side of the screen, that detector will smash into it. And unfortunately, the detector is pretty fragile and it's about a $10,000 uh, silicon diode if you break it so it's it's not a not a good day if you crash the backscatter detector now uh, compared to uh, the other SEMs in our lab like the Tescan Mira has a backscatter detector and it takes about two minutes for it to insert so you have more or less you have all day to stop the insertion if you think it's going to crash um, you're going to see here this detector comes in really fast so to use it um, I'm going to click on quad two and I'm actually going to change this quadrant to also be an electron beam image. And the advantage there is that I can then uh, image in both secondary mode and backscatter at the same time. Let me just get my focus. Uh, so I click on quad two, I can change it to be electron beam for my source signal. And then I'm going to go up here to the detector tab and I'm going to choose the CBS detector. And I have the uh, insert command right here. So I'm going to say insert, and it's going to ask, do you want to confirm? And I say yes. And there's, you can see the detector comes flying in from the side uh, very fast. Now I can start imaging with this detector by just pausing quad two. Now the backscatter detector does not function really well at low beam currents. It also doesn't function well at really low voltages. So uh, 2 kV should be okay for this, but my, my beam current is a little bit on the low side. So I'm gonna turn my beam current up to maybe uh, 0.2 nanoamps, just to get a little bit more signal on this uh, detector. And so you see that by doing that, um, I now have an image. I'm gonna adjust my brightness and contrast. Now the other thing that this detector doesn't like is fast scanning. So when you're when you're doing really really quick scanning, you're just going to get noise on this uh, this detector. What you need to do is slow your scan speed down. And as you slow your scanning down, you'll see the quality of the image improves dramatically. And this is why uh, this backscatter detector is it's nice to have the secondary electron image up at the same time because I can use the secondary electron image to um, do my fast scanning, move around, find the area that I want to look at, and also to adjust my focus and astigmatism. And then once I'm happy with my area, I can use the slow scanning to acquire the really pretty picture uh, from that backscatter detector. So I'm just fixing my focus and astigmatism. And I should probably, if I was going to take images for real, I would go and check the column alignment, but I'm just trying to show you this, how this detector works. So I slow my scanning down, um, and I can adjust my brightness and contrast a little bit. And so on the left, I have my secondary electron image. On the right, I have my backscatter image. And in this case, the backscatter detector does a really good job of showing me where the different composition materials are. Uh, so this sample has uh, its platinum with carbon nanoparticles all over it. So the carbon appears black because it's low atomic number. The platinum appears bright because it's higher atomic number. And that's very, very obvious in the backscatter image. The secondary electron image shows you topography. So I can see that there's all these little bumps on the surface of the platinum, but it's not really obvious that that, that is a different material in the secondary electron image. Um, just kind of other examples on, on here that I can show you. Uh, where let me find a good spot i like this stuff Right, so um, here's another area where you have some carbon with some embedded platinum particles. And the secondary electron image, it's not really obvious that there's another material in there on that surface because it's relatively smooth. 
but in the backscatter image, it sticks out like crazy that there's little embedded platinum particles in there. Um, so very, very, very useful detector, um, in my opinion. Uh, some things you can play around with. It, the detector has four segments on it. You can turn on and off those segments to try to get different types of signals. Um, the closer to the center of the detector you image with, the more atomic number contrast you'll get in your image. And the further out you go, the more topographic contrast you'll get in your backscatter image. And you can actually, if you want to, you can image multiple segments at the same time. So if I want to look at the segment A on this quadrant, I can do that. And I can go down and pick another quadrant, change it to electron beam, change it to the CBS detector, and let's do quadrant C. So you can kind of look at different where the different angles of backscatter signal are falling on the detector by by looking at different quadrants um, or for example D usually you don't get much on the D quadrant um, at this condition but yeah it's pretty noisy so can be useful if you're, if you're trying to do some real um, you know real complex backscatter imaging uh, it's a good idea to look at these different angles of signals see how they affect your result the reason the D signal looks so terrible right now is that there's only a certain uh, angle of signal coming off of this, um, coming off of here. So you, you have your, your sample, um, the detector segments are these circular things, which I uh, can't draw circles very well. All right, so your electron beam is coming down, hitting the sample, and then you have some angle range of signal coming off of the sample. But it's, it's confined to, there's a certain maximum that really the signal falls off to almost nothing. So like there's very few electrons going off this way. So if you're really close to the detector, this outer segment out here just really doesn't pick up much. Um, it's kind of similar to like a high angle dark field detector in TEM. If you go to like a really short camera distance, you're, you get really, really good uh, atomic number contrast, but your signal falls off to like nothing. Um, so if I want to get more signal on that outer ring, what I can do is if I drop the sample down a little bit away from that detector, then that same angle of signal will then fall on the D-ring. So if instead of imaging at 4 millimeters, if I go down to like 6 millimeters, um, we should see more signal on the D-ring now. And my focus went way out for some reason. And again, I have to slow down my scan speed. And so, so again, the, the D-ring is more of a topographic image. You can kind of see more of the um, structure in this stuff, whereas the A-ring in the center is much more of like a flat image and you just see the, um, the atomic number contrast mainly. So that's the CBS detector. Uh, again, be really careful when you use this because if you insert it um, with the sample in the wrong spot, you'll break this detector and it's, it's pretty expensive. So just make sure everything is, is four millimeters or more away from that, uh, the lens before you bring it in. So we can go and retract that detector. So I can click on uh, one of the quadrants and then say retract. And that backs out the CBS detector. Oh, I got a quick question. Yeah. So is it the back uh, scattering camera is kind of like the EVS in terms of like, I can kind of look at different composition of the, of the yeah, samples. So the backscatter detector image will be sensitive to the um, average atomic number of the whatever you're looking at. So generally the, the contrast scales with the atomic number squared. And okay. I mean, there's calculations that they go dig up the textbooks and stuff. There's all kinds of, of ways to try to simulate this. But um, in general, high atomic number regions 
will appear to be brighter than low atomic number regions. So okay. it doesn't necessarily tell you the composition, but it tells you like the relative um, atomic weights. It also scales with density as well, but usually people have like fully dense stuff. So that, that's a little harder to see, but so like if you say you have a sample, like like an iron chrome mixture or something like that, backscatter is probably not going to help much because the two elements are so similar in atomic number that you're not probably going to see much in backscatter. But in EDS, EDS is, is much more sensitive to that. EDS will tell you the difference between iron and chrome easily. Uh, I see. Does that make sense? So here, he, so here's more like a qualitative analysis. Yeah, it's, it's qualitative. It can be quantitative, but you've got to do a lot of work in, in terms of setting up your experiment to make it meaningful. Um, usually your sample needs to be really, really flat. It needs to be really well polished. Um, you have to know the, the angles that your detector captures uh, really well, and then you can try to try to simulate it. But um, okay. in, in, in terms of the, the setup on the Helios, I would definitely consider this more qualitative than quantitative. Um, but it is very okay. useful for telling where different materials are, which is what I'm showing here. Now, this sample is is insanely easy to image by backscatter because it's carbon and platinum. So there's an okay. enormous difference in atomic number between those two two materials. If I okay. go over, um, let me go to a different sample. So I'm, I'm going to switch back to my low resolution SEM lens. And let's go look at... Uh, there's a copper TEM grid over here on aluminum. And we'll probably, we should be able to see the difference between copper and aluminum, uh, but it will be, uh, I think, less dramatic than the carbon platinum example. So I go over here, remember new sample, so I want to get in focus. Uh, I'm just gonna focus on what are the, this little dust particle. Check my my link. So I'm at seven millimeter working distance. That's that's fine for the backscatter. And then uh, I can click on quad two, and I can say insert. All right. So here's our detector back in, and we'll go ahead and start imaging. So now I really have to to raise my contrast up quite a bit because there's not very much difference between the signal between the copper and aluminum. Um, but you can see here that the, the copper is brighter than the aluminum, which is what you'd expect. But it's nowhere near as dramatic uh, compared to the uh, carbon platinum sample. I see. But now where this can be nice is like, say, say I, I, I'm not sure that there's an impurity in here. I can use my backscatter imaging to kind of hunt around and see if I can find, uh, like maybe there's like a heavy particle stuck to the surface. If it's something like iron or, or something like that, it's going to show up like crazy. Um, so like this, I don't know, there's something down in there. So I don't know what that stuff is. Like it's probably like a silver paint residue or a scratch or something that was left behind when they made this. But whatever it is, it's way, it's much higher atomic number than the copper, which maybe that tells me something. If I, obviously I don't know much about the history of how they did this, but I can tell you whatever that is 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 heavier. So then I could go to EDS and I could do an EDS probe of that spot and try to figure out what that is but I'm using my backscatter detector to locate the stuff because otherwise you're just kind of hunting around blind if, if this is the type of experiment you want to do. And if you look at the secondary electron image, that doesn't really tell you a whole lot about this region. It looks like a scratch, 
to me, but I can't easily tell that there's some like embedded heavier atomic number material down in there because the contrast is very different compared to the backscattered contrast. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. All right. But yeah, the, the nice thing is on the, and I'm not going to go through the EDS stuff today, but um, the EDS detector controls are on the computer just next to me. So if I want to, I can just uh, go over there, turn on that software, and I can put the electron beam right down on top of, you know, that stuff and just have it scan right there. And I can record the spectrum on the EDS detector from that spot, and I can tell you exactly what that is. And that could be quantitative or qualitative, depending on what you do. And then you know, you know what you're looking at. All right, so let's take out the backscatter detector. Um, some of the other uh, imaging things you can do with the ESCM are, are really more specific to looking at you know, like really small stuff or really difficult to image samples like you know, insulating things. Um, they generally, the, the way we image those kinds of samples is generally trying to get the voltage down. Um, so, for example, I'm probably tempting fate here, but I've got a piece of plastic on this um, sample holder here. If I go over and look at this, uh, this is this is going to go really bad, I'm sure. So this is a this is like a piece of um, polyethylene, I think. If I'm trying to image that surface, I'm not going to see much of anything. It just charges up like crazy. But if I can drop my voltage down low enough. Like say I go down to 500 volts, um, I might start to be able to see some kind of evidence of like the surface. Um, but it's still charging up pretty badly. So like here, there's a couple little particles stuck on there. Um, but imaging imaging plastic is is notoriously difficult. But if I want to go lower, uh, I, I mentioned I can only go down to 350 volts. Um, if I want to go lower than that, I have to use a module called stage bias. And so if I turn this on, stage bias applies a potential to the sample, which will cause the electron beam to slow down as it approaches the surface. And what it does is it gives you the equivalent of a lower accelerating voltage without actually having to drop the voltage in the column. So um, my landing energy in the, is still at 500 volts, but you see this little like fishhook icon showed up, and I have a thousand volts applied to the sample. So what that means is my electron column is actually operating at 1500 volts, and then I'm losing a thousand volts of, of potential as the beam approaches the sample. So the beam is hitting the sample with still 500 volts. But with what I really want to do here is now that stage bias is on the software will let me drop the voltage down lower than 350. So I can take this down to, let's just try like 300 volts um, or even lower. Like it's still charging up a little bit. You can kind of see here these artifacts. Let's try 200. Yeah, it's getting better. I don't know if this is going to work. This, is, this might not um, image very well. Let me try 100 volts. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to work. 50 is the minimum that you can go to. But the idea is that if you can get your voltage low enough, you should be able to image uh, any sample with an electron beam, even if it's like glass or something. Um, the trick is just to get the voltage down enough. Let me go a little bit more. On. Uh, 
Um, so a sample like this, if I slow my scanning speed way down, I get a lot more artifacts from the charge buildup. So uh, faster scanning is definitely helpful here. And in order to get a nice image with a fast scan speed, uh, you want to use frame integration. So we can set that up by going to scan preferences. And then I'm going to use my snapshot tool. And I'm going to change my dwell time to be 50 nanoseconds, which is the fastest I can scan. And then for integration, I'm going to do a lot of frames in integration. Let's try like 64 frames. And there's a drift correction function. I want to keep this on and hit apply and then say OK. So now if I do my snapshot, I'm going to get an integrated image. And I'm still getting some uh, charge, kind of charge discharge noise in here. But you can kind of see I, I can actually resolve some stuff on the surface, which is, you know, imaging on a piece of plastic is not usually very easy on a, on a high, volt, high vacuum SEM. Um, but this is kind of the idea. So if you're looking at polymer spheres, uh, maybe you're going to have to try something like this if you don't want to coat them. So that's the stage bias or beam deceleration module. Uh, this can go all the way up to 4,000 volts, but I would recommend you, if you're going to try this, try like maybe 1,000 or 2,000 volts and see what happens. Um, the higher you go with the stage bias, the harder it's going to be to get the column to align. So the other other thing that you can do, um, which isn't going to help on this sample because it's, it's insulating, but uh, let's say you want to image at low voltage and you want to have reasonable resolution is you can use the monochromator. Uh, here, let's go over to the gold. Um, so let's say I want to image at 500 volts. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have very good resolution here because of the low voltage suffers from a lot of chromatic aberration. So if I can monochromate the beam, uh, you can remove some of that from the uh, the image problems. Now the way to turn on the monochromator is to um, go to a condition that allows you to turn on this this mode called UC. And it's only uh, allowed to use at a uh, 5 kV or lower accelerating voltage and 25 picoamps or lower beam current. So if I go to 25 picoamp beam current and I'm at 500 volts, I should now be able to go up to my beam tab and I can turn on the UC module. Now in UC mode, uh, there's an additional alignment step that becomes available in the direct adjustments called UC centering. And the way this works is you go to crossover mode and you're gonna see a series of bands on the screen. And what you wanna do is move this UC centering around and try to find the center of that pattern. So if I just go in the vertical direction, you can see I kind of scan over this pattern. Um, and I just wanna kind of make a guess at where the midpoint is. So I kind of drop off, you see there's like an edge right here that kind of chops that pattern off. And if I go the other way, there's an edge right here. And I just want to kind of make a guess at like where the midpoint is. And then I want to scan left and right and try to get this either as bright as possible or get it centered. Um, you can kind of see there's like a, there's more fall off on the edges there. So just kind of make a guess at where the middle is. And that's all you have to do for UC centering. Then I use source tilt, put that spot in the center of the screen, just like before, and then turn off crossover mode. And now um, what we should find is that uh, once I get my stigmators adjusted out, is that the resolution of this image should be quite a bit better than it was without the monochromator turned on. So just got to get my lens alignment fixed here. Uh, 
I'm going to say that good enough. All right, so not a fantastic image, but um, if I take, well, I still have some astigmatism or something. I don't know if you can see, there's like a texture up here in this gold. It's very like a double image, which tells me I have something going on with my uh, column. All right, so that's um, all right. So let's just try this. This is eight thousand x image with the monochromator on. And let's go over here. Uh, we'll do ETD detector, and I'm going to turn the monochromator off, and I'll see what the image looks like with it on and with it off. So to be fair, I need to check my column alignment again. All right, focus. Sometimes when I do this, it ends up being the opposite, that the, the regular image looks better. So hopefully that's not the case. I think it will be. It kind of depends on how good the uh, tool is aligned. Because the, uh, the, the monochromator mode, if the alignment's really terrible in that condition, then it's going to be worse resolution than without the monochromator. which I think is just based on what I'm seeing right now, I think that's going to be the case because this looks better. Yeah, so, I don't know, lousy demonstration. The, the non-monochromated image to me is way sharper. Um, if you look at, like, the gold structure in the background, this is fuzzy. And you can actually see the gold texture in there. But uh, this this tool is getting a brand new field emitter and a new lens and a new detector and all kinds of new stuff in the next couple of weeks. So um, it will hopefully behave much more predictably after that. Um, but that's the UC mode. Uh, to be honest, I don't I don't see a lot of our users using the UC mode, but um, it's really it's best suited if you're doing a lot of real low voltage imaging where you, where you can't use the beam deceleration module. And it really helps uh, drive up resolution, assuming it's working correctly, which I don't think it is right now. Uh, all right, so um, it's 2 o'clock. Do you guys want to call it a day and keep going? Um, we can look at the FIB for a little bit, or do you want to because I'm going to do the FIB stuff again next week. So we can stop if you want. Yeah, I have a meeting in a little bit. Um, okay. So I think I'm going to head out, but I'll definitely be at the FIB one. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, so the so for the FIB one, are you going to use it on the same instrument, like showing on the same instrument, uh, this one? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'll, and I'll, I'll go over how to use the FIB, how to use the gas injectors. Um, I was going to demonstrate how to do a cross-section cut which will be um, hopefully useful for what you want to do, and then also um, probably do a TEM sample. Okay, cool. And, and but I just have like two more quick questions. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to image the polymer-based samples, right? Yeah. So when I normally use use it to use the test scan to do the SEM, I would just coat my polymer with the gold. So would that kind of pose a, uh, some difficulty when I want to use the yeah, EDS to look at the composition. 
Uh, it might because the EDS is going to pick up a lot of x-rays from the gold coating, but not so there's not going to be very many x-rays generated from the polymer. Uh, okay. So I would recommend if you can do it without coating them, it would be better. But if we're okay. gonna if you're gonna use the fib to cut the the spheres in half, mm -hmm. then the gold coating will only be on the outside of the sphere, so the cut surface will be uncoated. True. So then I will have to use some other method to try to image the polymer that without coating. Yeah, which um, so I I can show you a technique to use the the platinum gas injector in inside the fib to coat that surface after you cut it. And okay. you can do you can do a really really thin layer of platinum that it'll still show up in the X-ray uh, spectra, but it's mm -hmm. much much thinner than a gold coating would be. And you can actually do um, X-ray mapping and things like that through that thin platinum layer. Okay. That that'd be my suggestion if you're going to be doing this on the fib. Okay. Cool. Uh, now that doesn't work really well if you're going to do tomography. Um, you really can't use that option. Because it's it's it'd be too tedious to coat the sample after every fib slice, right? But for just single view type cross sections, that that works really well. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I, the last thing I need to show you is just how to shut the tool down. Um, it, it's pretty simple. When we're done imaging, we're just going to go to beam control and we're going to click uh, the beam on button. To turn the electron beam off. Uh, if you had any insertable detectors in, you would want to retract them. And then we can click on the vent button and that will start the chamber vent. Um, the system is set up so that the uh, stage should lower automatically when you vent the system. Um, just make sure that it does. So I, I don't know if you saw there, the stage dropped. Um, if I want, if we want to, I can move the stage back to that kind of loading position. I told you the 75 X 75 Y. Um, so we can go back over there. It makes it easier to get the samples out through the door. But once the chamber is vented, we're going to open the door, remove our samples, and then we're going to close the door and, and hit the pump button. And that way the, uh, the microscope will be under high vacuum. You can just leave the stage adapter in the chamber. There's no reason to remove it um, unless the next person, you know, you know, they want a different one. You could take it out if you wanted to be nice to them. Um, your image, oh, your image data. So when you record your images, you're going to be saving them to a file on the support computer. Uh, so there's a map drive on here uh, called Helios Temporary User Data. This is where I want you to go to save all your images. And you'll see all the other users have folders in there. Um, when you're done with your session on the support computer, which I don't have a view of that screen right now, but um, it's right next to where I'm sitting. You're just going to go there and you can move your images from the support computer hard drive to the file server and then transfer them that way. I don't want you to put flash drives into any of the computers by the fibs. Um, transfer your data through the network, and then you can use flash drives on the workstations out in the hallway. Uh, that's much safer for these uh, microscopes to do it that way. Uh, okay, so the chamber's vented. I'm gonna go over and pull my samples out, and then uh, we will close the chamber, pump it back down, and everything should be good. So let me turn off my crop filter here. Oh, I'm upside down. There we go. Um, now, I've had the same gloves on the whole time. It's a good idea to change your gloves. Uh, normally, I don't even wear gloves when I'm operating the system, but because of the coronavirus stuff, I, I have gloves on all the time these days. But um, I'm going to assume that my gloves are all coated with junk because I've been touching the mouse and the keyboard and everything. So. Um, change your gloves, or if you don't want to change your gloves, put on a new pair of gloves over them. 
uh, before you pull your samples out. That way we don't contaminate the chamber. So I will give both of you guys um, daytime access to the Helios after this. And then um, you can, uh, you know, attend the, the next training session where I'll talk about the FIB topics. But in the meantime, if there is an opening and you want to come in and try to use this just for some imaging, you know, feel free uh, to do so. And after you use the tool for a, um, a couple sessions, you can get after hours access. So I haven't been in MC squared in a while. Is there a way, like if we are having trouble um, with the instrument that we can like get you to help us out without like violating any rules or anything? Um, so we're al I'm allowed to come into the room for short periods of time as long as, you know, you and I both have masks on. Okay. So if it's something that I can fix or help you within like a minute or two, just, um, okay. you know, come find a staff member and ask for help. And that's not a problem. If it's something like a if you need training on something that's going to take, you know, an hour, then we would try to set up something like this where we can help you remotely. Mm -hmm. All right. So okay. I got my samples out. I close the door, and then uh, hit the pump button. And then just make sure the door seals up. You know, give it a little tug, make sure it's it's uh, secure. And then uh, I would go and log off in the FOM program so that my uh, charges are stopped at this point. All right, so that is uh, that's the basic uh, SEM operation with the Helios. So I will. Um, See both of you with the next uh, training session. We'll go over the FIB stuff. All right. And, thanks, Alan. That yep. was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions. I, I'm happy to answer them by email um, or, or in person if you're around the lab. You know, just come talk to me and we, I can help you. All right. So have a good day. Oh, guys. Also, thanks yeah. a lot. So did oh. you send out the, the link for the, for the FIB? Uh, I, I may not have. I will check. Yeah. If okay. I, if yeah, I just want to check. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, no thanks problem. All right, bye.